This is three hours of some of the most nuclear revenge stories on Reddit. Starting with this incredible tale in which a grandma gets her horrible neighbor's house demolished. Grandma's revenge. I immediately have to write this down because it is the most amazing thing I have ever heard. I was visiting my grandma and grandpa to celebrate a bunch of summer birthdays together. But when I pulled up to their house, the plot to the right was completely empty. As in no stones, no base, no debris, just slightly overgrown grass grass where there used to be a house when the hellos were said and the party started i absolutely had to know what happened so i went to ask my grandparents and goodness gracious i was not expecting the roller coaster of a story they told me a couple of years ago my grandparents had some very unpleasant neighbors loud at all hours trash in the yard arguing with other people on the street just absolute nuisances it was a husband and wife and their adult son who would come and go irregularly The wife would get into arguments with anyone about anything and the husband would physically intimidate the people who spoke up for themselves. They weren't sure what exactly was the deal with the son, but it couldn't have been anything good as it was well known he'd been in the county jail more than a few times. The house apparently reflected the tenants as it looked awful. It was sagging and dilapidated, loose beams and peeling paint, but nothing was ever done about it due to the guy who rented out the place being a slumlord. We'll get to him later. It all came to a breaking point one night when my grandparents returned home to find their back door smashed in and some of my grandparents' guitars missing. Now, grandpa loves his music and has been singing and playing his whole life. So it's safe to say those guitars are not only very memorable to him, but dang expensive too. They of course went to the police and after some digging, they found that the guitars had been sold at a pawn shop or someplace by the sun. They couldn't get the guitars back, unfortunately, but I believe my grandparents were fairly compensated since the guitars were insured. Today alone, guitars have insurance. Given how expensive the guitars were, the theft was absolutely a felony and the son once again ended up in jail. After that, the neighbors would harass my grandparents through the fence or on their porch, meaning it was difficult for them to even sit outside. They'd call them foul names, throw trash over the fence, and the husband would still try and get physical. Now, while my grandpa is a very chill and mellow guy, my grandma would take trash from no one, especially not jerks like these. So what did she do? She got the house condemned. It was easy for her to do, really. She called the local authorities, general attorney, property manager, I don't know, and they came and did an inspection though it was clear by the outside of the house that it hadn't been properly maintained for a long time. One call led to more calls and the property was deemed unfit to live in, which forced the rude neighbors to move out. I'm not sure what happened to them or where they went, but supposedly they were put up in a nearby hotel by the slumlord until the house could be fixed. Ooh, foreshadowing. Now enter the slumlord. Of course, his tenants told him who had reported the house. So therefore he's upset with my grandparents. But rather than fix the house, he gets aggressive the first day he's there, yelling at my grandparents about how they're idiots for reporting him and how they've cost him a bunch of money and he's going to sue them and on and on. It gets to the point where the the across-the-street neighbors called the local police to come defuse the situation, which they do. A few weeks pass and my grandma hasn't seen the slumlord or anyone around to fix the house. Not being one to let things go easily, she starts making frequent calls to a bunch of services reporting the house and its lack of progress. Each time, the slumlord's truck would appear for a day and then leave without changing a thing. Grandpa said he'd block in their driveway, but since they stay at home most of the time, it wasn't a major issue. Grandma, of course, disagreed. Finally, my grandma had complained enough that officials came out and condemned the house for demolition. This had two major effects. First, the rude neighbors were now practically homeless since as soon as they and the slumlord ran out of money to pay for the hotel, they'd be stranded. And second, the slumlord still had to pay a load of fines for the state of the house. The rest is more his fault than my grandma's actions, but he'd refuse to pay and refuse to show up in court leading to a warrant being put out for his arrest. A few months ago, the demolition teams came and tore down the place, leaving the lot perfectly barren. They even removed the driveway, so now it just looks like an extension of my grandparents' side yard. My grandparents were not sure of the final state of the neighbors and slumlord, but my grandma looked very pleased with herself as she finished the story. I love her so much. Well, there we go. What a way to start off this absolute marathon of an episode. A phenomenal tale of revenge right there. Your grandma's just incessant drive 
to absolutely destroy those horrible neighbors is brilliant to see. And let me tell you, it sets up this episode very well. Let's get straight in to our next story. Entitled Stepmonster got herself banned from my wedding. I am a 28 year old man and my stepmother who is 49 is a wannabe party planner. She's taken it upon herself to plan and host every party and holiday my dad's family has thrown since she married him. I never loved those occasions growing up. She's controlling and gets upset if people complain about anything, but humored her for my dad's sake. According to him, this helps her feel included. I'm getting married to my fiance Jane in July. We got engaged in early 2021, but Jane ended up getting pregnant a couple of months after that. And we decided to postpone the wedding to focus on our son for a while. So we've had a long engagement. My stepmother has tried to hijack our wedding plans from day one, complaining, contacting our planner, showing up unannounced to Jane's dress appointments and more. And we've repeatedly asked her to stop. Now dad wants us to humor her again, but she's clearly resentful of the fact that she's not hosting the wedding or being labeled mother of the groom in invitations. Besides our baby boy, we also have Luke, who is a four-year-old, Jane's paternal half-brother. She got custody of him a few months into our relationship after his parents died. I ended up moving in with them during the pandemic and have been in Luke's life since he was a baby. He doesn't call me dad and refers to us as his sister and his OP, but we love him like a son. Stepmother though, hates Luke. Okay, sorry to interrupt. She hates a four-year-old child. Crazy. Anyway, she accuses Jane of baby trapping her way into the family. That accusation only got worse after our son was born. My dad gets along with Jane and adores the kids, but stepmother demands him to refuse babysitting Luke so we don't leave the kids with them often. Instead, Jane's brother and sister-in-law usually watch the kids for us as their children are close to ours in age. We had a thing last Sunday and my brother-in-law was out of town with his family. Jane's other siblings live in different cities as well as my mum and sister. My dad agreed to babysit at our place and we left. We came back to find both kids crying, stepmother screaming and dad weakly trying to calm everyone down. Apparently, Luke had told stepmother that both he and our son were going to be our ring bearers, and she went ballistic, at a four-year-old that is. She screamed that she wasn't going to allow that because he wasn't family. She then unfortunately got physical when he started crying. His lip is still split. She'd never gotten to this point before. Oh my. We immediately banned her from our house and from our wedding. Dad is fuming and has said he's not going without her. He's also convinced half of his side of the family by severely downplaying what stepmother did to boycott the wedding as well. This includes my stepbrother who fully agrees with his mother no matter how many times I try to tell him the truth. Me and Jane are refusing to budge, but many of my cousins who aren't coming anymore are asking us to reconsider. Pretty much all of Jane's family agrees with us, but one of her aunts has suggested that maybe stepmother is acting out because she doesn't feel welcomed by my family. I've honestly had it with my family enabling her behavior. I love my dad and really want him at my wedding, but I'm more than willing to go no contact if it means protecting my family. Now guys, the good news is that there is an update to this post, so we will find out what happens next. However, I do have to say just off the rip, the fact that some people in your family are defending your stepmother because she might feel left out of the family, that's a reason why she's abusing a four-year-old. Like, what is going on there? Seriously, what's going on? And look, maybe it's just a split lip and that's not that deep. No, sorry, I disagree. A four-year-old has been physically hurt and people are defending her. What is she doing? Now, that initial post was written five days ago, but just five hours ago, we got the following updates. I'll start off by saying that me and Jane are going no contact with my dad and stepmom. We haven't really spoken to either of them since the incident, and I don't plan on being the one to reach out. Any communication between us is being handled by my younger sister. She's completely on our side, but will remain in low contact for the time being. I've decided to adopt Jane's way of dealing with people she cares about. Forgive what's apologized for, but never forget. Basically, if dad or my stepmom ever truly understand what they did wrong and sincerely apologize, we are willing to forgive them, even if begrudgingly so, but we will never ignore or let them forget what they did to our family. And for the time being, neither of them will be allowed near Luke, our baby, and any other kids we may have in the future, even if we do forgive them. Well, I for one completely agree with all of that, and I'm happy to hear it. As for the rest of my family, I read a lot of comments suggesting that I post pictures of Luke's face, as well as the nanny cam footage. 
I'm not very active on social media, but even if I was, I'm not comfortable exposing my injured preschooler like that, especially given that nothing on the internet ever truly goes away. I also decided not to share the pictures with my family unless truly necessary. I should probably mention that while my family adores my dad, most of them aren't very fond of my stepmom. She had two failed marriages prior to meeting my father, the first of which resulted in my stepbrother, and he cheated on his then girlfriend to be with her. My family loved that girlfriend and disliked my stepmom right away. Not only has she been controlling and manipulative since the beginning, she's also tried to force her way into the family matriarch role by any means possible. Taking over planning duties for every family event was her favorite way of doing it because of all the attention and compliments that come with it. The main reason why I hated these parties growing up was because she'd always find a way to make everything about her, including Christmas and mine and my sister's birthdays. The rest of the family felt neutral about it, but they never liked her. With Luke, it was different. Most of my relatives didn't meet him until COVID restrictions got looser, and by then he was two years old. He's a bright and genuinely lovable kid, and there weren't really any other small children in the family, so everyone immediately started cooing over him. The way I see it, my stepmom got upset that Jane and Luke were accepted by my family so easily compared to her experience, and that is why she resents them both. But I can't confirm that. She was also mad that, aside from not being the planner, she would have absolutely no involvement in the wedding party. She tried to pressure us into letting her officiate. One of Jane's best friends was offered that role a year ago, making stepbrother my best man. He wasn't interested, and I'd already got on my best friend or asking her sister's daughter to be our flower girl. But we'd promised Jane's three-year-old niece. Also, her sister's daughter is 15 and doesn't know us. Sorry, that is so weird. Imagine just a random 15-year-old girl being like, uh, yeah, let me just carry these flowers. Sorry, I just got a funny image in my head. Anyway, she also tried to convince us to let my dad walk Jane down the aisle since her father's gone. But her eldest brother, the brother-in-law I mentioned in the first post, had already been enlisted. Okay, that one is crazy. My stepmom was disappointed that my family wasn't as involved in the wedding as Jane's and kept making comments about how that would never happen if we put me in charge. All of that being said, there is nothing that can excuse being that awful to a child, especially if it really is the petty jealousy that I suspect. Because I haven't spoken with my father, my sister has been keeping me updated on what he's been up to. As I found out through her, the story my dad and stepmom told the rest of the family completely erases Luke's injury and the abuse charges. Oh yeah, guys, OP left a really small edit on the first post saying that they actually were going to press charges on the stepmom for what she did to Luke, which is completely fair. It insinuates that me and Jane banned them because we got annoyed with my stepmom and decided to take it out on my dad as well. Because most people already dislike my stepmom, explaining what actually happened that night wasn't hard. And most of the relatives that I actually wanted at the wedding have apologized and are now berating my dad as well. The people that didn't believe us, as well as those saying we overreacted, have been told they are not welcome in our home anymore. Those are mostly people from my dad's generation, so I can't say I'm surprised. But the realization that they're so biased that they're willing to protect a woman they hate after she hurt a child just to make my dad happy has reassured me that I don't need any of them in my life. My stepbrother is still in denial. He refuses to believe his mother could hurt a child, even with all the evidence we have. I have to admit, I understand. I love my mum too, but that doesn't mean I'd excuse his obliviousness. So he's banned too. It sucks because we were close growing up, but I don't regret it. Besides, Jane has three other siblings besides Luke, the older brother-in-law, a twin brother, and a younger sister, and I'm closer to them than I ever was with him. Speaking of Jane's family, they're all furious over what happened and have been extremely supportive of us. Jane's maternal family basically adopted Luke after she got custody of him and have called frequently to make sure he's okay. We did manage to save some money with everybody we uninvited and have decided to use it to help Jane's cousin. She lives in a different country and was previously unable to come to the wedding, so we're paying for her plane ticket. That is awesome. Luke has gotten much better and is almost completely back to being the sunny child he's always been. The split lip was shallow. It's healing slowly, but didn't require any stitches. We sat him down a few days ago and explained that my dad and stepmonster wouldn't be around anymore. He really liked my dad, but understands that he and stepmom are attached at the hip. He's clearly scared of her, but we're doing our best to make him feel safe. 
That is so sad that a four-year-old has that much terror in their lives at that age. Wow. Me and Jane have reassured him that he is family. We love him and no one will ever change that. I'm not too worried about my dad or stepmom trying to show up at the wedding, but we've alerted the venue and given them pictures just in case they try anything. Better safe than sorry. Some people brought attention to the fact that my stepmom is a hypocrite for saying Luke isn't family. I agree, for obvious reasons. Her main excuse for pretty much everything she does is that she doesn't feel like my family welcomes her. Dad has been guilting me to take part in everything she plans by reminding us of that for as long as I can remember. The way he continues to make excuses for her without realizing this is basically a case of the pot calling the kettle black, except Luke actually is family. This is what has made me accept that while I will always love my dad, it's not healthy or safe for me and my family to be around him anymore. It hurts to know that my son won't have his only remaining bio grandfather in his life, but he has two amazing step grandpas to make up for it. For now, I'm sad, but satisfied with how things have turned out. I don't like to complain about my life. It's a mess, but a beautiful one. I love my fiance, I love my kids, and I'm lucky enough to love my job. We're happy, and I'm not letting anyone ruin that. And there we go. Great story. Really enjoyed that one. You know what? I really like the fact that throughout this, you kept almost reminding us the reason as to why you were treating your dad in the same way you were treating your stepmom, alienating him from the family. Well, not alienating him, but you know what I mean. Going no contact. When he, to be fair, himself wasn't doing anything particularly badly but yeah you just summed it up at the end right there the fact that he is enabling your stepmom's disgusting behavior if anything is just as bad as what your stepmom is doing right now op has said that they hope that this is the last update on the story but they'll keep us posted it's one of those ones i really really hope that they do not show up at your wedding but if they do wow it would make for some Reddit post. How blind are you? I am legally blind. I have no sight in one eye and very little sight in the other, but I can see a little. I walk with a sight cane, but I generally do need some help to get around. I was at the airport in Cincinnati, Ohio, returning from a business trip, and I asked the person helping me to take me to a Starbucks since I was desperate for caffeination. She put me in line, then said she'd be back for me in 20 minutes. So I'm standing in line when this woman starts creeping on my right then a little more and a little bit more this dog was trying to pull cutsies on me oh i don't think so so i slyly slid my cane over to my right effectively preventing said cutsies she realizes she's been caught and huffs a bit having her plan of cutting in front of an undercaffeinated blind person at 6 45 a.m effectively thwarted i get my drink and take a seat most people just took their drinks to their gates so most of the tables were empty Then Cutsy Carol sits down at my table and waves her hand in front of my face and we have the following exchange. So, are you blind or what? Pardon? Like, how much can you see? Are you faking? Just how blind are you? I mean, I saw enough to know that you were attempting to cut in front of a blind person. So you can see. She waves her hand in my face again. Can you see this? Why do you need a cane if you can see? Is it macular degeneration or what? Mom, it's too early for this. Please leave my table. I don't owe you an explanation or any part of my medical history. I'm just trying to enjoy my drink in peace while I wait for my guide. Jeez, I was just asking. She then huffs and leaves for parts unknown. Thank God. I don't know why people see someone who is disabled and feel entitled to their story or their medical devices. I've had people grab my cane and pull me where they want me to go. Parents who think it's cute to let their kids grab my cane it's not last fourth of july a random woman saw me walking with my family and grabbed my arm to drag me over to her son who had recently lost his eyesight so i could tell him my story didn't ask just grabbed my daughter let her know how horribly inappropriate this was and this woman was super offended because she was just trying to help my son adapt to his new reality like she thought i owed that to her by daring to be blind disabled people aren't sideshows we're just trying to live our lives just like you are op you make such a good point you have a disability it's your disability no one else needs to know anything about it it's not their disability it's yours why do some people in this world feel the need or or feel entitled to know about the ins and outs of a random stranger's disability it's so weird i don't get it and also why on earth would you cut ahead of anyone in the queue anyway let alone a blind person i mean come on insane now for our next entitled people story entitled karen doesn't believe i have surgery this happened about 10 years ago 
I was 22 at the time and had to have knee surgery to clear out shredded cartilage about a week after my birthday. This story takes place three days after the surgery. My mum, who was a nurse, my now husband, who was my boyfriend of two years at the time, and my best friend decided to take me shopping to try and get my mind off the surgery and to pick up craft supplies so I'd be bored while off of work. I should mention it was an orthopedic surgery, so I didn't need to use crutches if I didn't feel the need, and I should be walking some. When we got to the craft store, not our first stop, my husband and best friend made me use one of the store's wheelchairs. I was being stubborn because I could still walk, just not very fast or as long without brakes. Now, since I didn't really want to be in the chair, my husband and friend decided to make a game out of it. Like, who could push me the fastest? Now, you might think we're wrong, but let me state, this was in the middle of the day on a Monday, so the store was not busy, and my husband and best friend would check the aisle to make sure that the coast was clear. After one of the speeding events, I was looking at something in an aisle, and my mum pulled my husband and best friend away to look at something else. It was something she thought I would like and was going to get it as a surprise. Well, I decided I didn't want whatever it was that I was looking at, and I stood up to put it back. This is when Karen appears, berating me for using the wheelchair as a toy and telling me that there are people who actually need it. Calmly, I explain. I just had surgery, and that is why I'm using it. But she then goes on and on about how she saw what my friends were doing, and that I'm obviously lying. I explain that they were just trying to make me feel better, and I tell them to push me normally from now on. But this did not appease Karen, and she was still berating me. At this point, I roll up my pants leg and show her the compression bandages that I'm still wearing. She goes on about how that means nothing, and I could have just wrapped my knees as an excuse in case we were caught, and she bet the other people with me also have their knees wrapped. My group returns at this point and says the same thing as me. But Karen is still not having it. We're all apparently lying. I look at my mum and I ask if I can take off my bandages, as they were supposed to be removed the next day. She says I really shouldn't, but she could rewrap it for me if needed. At this point, I take off the bandages before anyone can stop me, and I show Karen my knee in all its post-surgery glory. It was bruised, swollen, and crusty at the incision sites, and you could still see the iodine on my skin. Karen's face went white, and she looked like she was going to be sick. She started stammering that I didn't need to go that far. As my mum is rewrapping my knee, scolding me and Karen under her breath, I look at Karen and say, What else did you want me to do? I told you, they told you, I showed you the bandages, but you wouldn't get off your high horse and insisted that we were lying. At this point, a staff member comes to check if we need any help, and Karen runs for the door. We had a pleasant rest of our day and stopped for ice cream on the way home. And also, just one final edit for clarification. We were not running, drifting around corners, using the brakes while moving, doing wheelies, having more than one person in the chair. Instead, we were speed walking with clear aisles and just seeing how far I would go with one push from a dead stop. We were still very careful with the wheelchair. You know what? I actually kind of do sympathize with this Karen off the rip. You know, she sees someone messing about in a wheelchair. And let's be completely honest, you were messing about. Having fun, of course, but you were messing about. And then she sees you stand up. I think that's fair enough to suggest that you probably are kind of messing around, which you admit that you, that you were, you know, you're having fun. However, after you explain everything to her, show her the bandages, all your friends, you know, your mum, your, your now husband is explaining to her, no, I get it, we were kind of having fun, but no, this person actually, OP actually is disabled at the moment. Um, even after all of that, she still doubles down and is like, no, I know you're lying. I reckon everyone's wearing knee bandages. I mean, come on. And then she gets annoyed when you show her your injury and is like, oh, you didn't need to do that. No, you literally did to explain the point. So look, fair enough that she was a little bit dubious at first, but the more and more evidence she got, the more and more she doubled down. And that is entitlement. Now for our next entitled people story. An old lady decided I'm the one that should move in a physical therapy waiting room. I was born with some physical deformities. They aren't visible unless you're a professional, but they've been causing me problems all my life. This includes a foot deformity where it often hurts to even stand for long periods of time, although physical therapy helps me manage it and be able to do more. I only started physical therapy again recently as I didn't have the money to continue it for quite a while. I always get to my appointment early as I have anxieties about being late and today was no different. I sat down in a near empty waiting room, but as it got closer to my appointment, the waiting room started to fill up and all of the chairs were taken. Note that all the other people in the waiting room were elderly at the time while I'm in my 20s and I'm often mistaken for someone much younger than I am. Well, this woman came in with her husband. Her husband seemed to be the one here for physical therapy and took the last seat. 
while the woman went to talk to the people at the front desk It was only when she turned around that she realized that all of the seats were taken and she might have to stand So what does she do? She walked right in front of me and without saying a word stared me down I was on my phone and I made sure not to look at her But i'm not someone who likes confrontation and I was counting down the minutes until my appointment The husband offered his wife his own seats, but she said no, it's fine and kept staring me down I think she knew better than to say anything with the receptionist right there As she probably didn't want to risk causing trouble for her husband Which is the only reason she didn't say anything in the end some equally elderly guy offered his seats She actually asked you don't have a problem with your legs or anything. Do you? The guy assured her it was a problem with his shoulder so she sat down and that was that that's all there is to the encounter i know there wasn't some crazy event or anything but it always frustrates me when people assume that i deserve my seat the least because of my age even in a god dang physical therapy waiting room well look we don't know for sure if this woman was a hundred percent not disabled herself she could have had an issue as well however it does seem unlikely that she did and for her to just assume that because you're younger you're okay to stand up even though you're literally in a physical therapy institution is so dumb like that's the thing that i'm thinking for these first three stories anyway the people involved are just incredibly dumb I shouldn't even ask you just stared at you probably got up in your in your physical space just looking at you again Stupid and also very very weird. Actually, you know what? I just remembered she actually declined when someone else offered her a seat Therefore if you can choose where to sit you can choose to stand you clown and now for our final story of this episode Entitled woman tries to take my wife's accessible parking spots then gets angry when I call her out. I am a 42 year old trans woman and I live in an apartment building with a reserved accessible parking spot for my wife who is wheelchair bound. Yesterday, I came home to find a red Chevy Silverado parked in our spot. There was no disabled placard or license plate tag. So I knocked on some neighbor's doors to see if they knew who it belonged to. Nobody answered. I decided to make a fake parking ticket, citing the violation as parking in a reserved accessible space without proper placard. Right after I put the fake parking ticket on the truck's windshield, the owner of the truck came out and asked me what I was doing. I told her she was parked in our spots. She rudely said that she was working for building management and that if I had a problem, I needed to take it up with them. I told her it wasn't her spot and she needed to move. But again, she refused. I went back upstairs and into my apartment. A minute later, I heard a knock at the door and opened it to find the fake parking ticket in the door jam with their reply written on the bottom. They'd written some transphobic and homophobic slurs on it. I went back outside with my phone out to try and take a picture of their license plate. However, an angry looking young man was at the bottom of the stairs. He told me I needed to watch what I say to his mama. He said I didn't look disabled. I told him it's my wife who cannot walk. He then asked where my car was, implying he wanted to do some damage to it. He called me the N word, then misgendered me and was acting aggressive. Feeling unsafe and not wanting to escalate the situation further, I told them to have a nice day and I went back inside the house. I called the building management, who expressed their condolences and said that I should call the police. I called the police, who said they sent an officer when they could. 20 minutes later, an officer called and said they drove by, but by then, the people had already left. I'm so angry and upset by this whole experience. I can't believe someone would be so entitled and disrespectful, especially to someone who is disabled. I'm also disappointed that the police didn't do more to help. I'm posting this story in the hopes that it will raise awareness of the issue of accessible parking. It's not just a convenience for people with disabilities, it's a necessity. If you see someone parked in an accessible spot without a placard or tag, please don't be afraid to say something. It could make a big difference to someone's life. Oh, wow. Ending with probably the most serious of all the entitled people's stories in this episode. I mean, yeah, you definitely the right thing. Get out of there. At that point, when you're literally being threatened and having, you know, verbal abuse just spouted at you. I mean, that's truly horrible stuff there. I don't quite know which word was worse. My goodness me. Yeah, get out. Call the police. It's a shame they couldn't come quicker and actually see these guys and just, you know, give them a warning or, hey, at least do something. (laughs) Stop them from abusing you. But wow. What a terrible, terrible spot to be in. I mean, literally getting abused for asking somebody to move out of a disabled parking spot. That is unbelievable. My horrible mother-in-law is homeless and my wife and I don't care. I'm a 25-year-old man and I'm married to a 26-year-old woman named Carol. And her mother, Danielle, who is 61, is a complete bag of garbage. 
and that's the nicest thing to say during carol's childhood danielle would always belittle carol and manipulate her into the most bs stuff mostly always claiming that her father abandoned them in colorado to seek fame and fortune in california and refusing to pay child supports whereas she would actually spend said child support on her own self buying books and clothes and not supporting her daughter. Danielle also changed Carol's last name on social security to Danielle's last name when she was a little kid, which made it incredibly difficult for Carol to find a job as an adult because she was an illegal alien to the US government. That meant she had one last name on her birth certificate and a different last name on her social security card. Danielle also had a very bad job that didn't pay the best and had to get an apartment with Carol under Carol's name because Danielle had terrible credit. And Carol had a zero credit score because she was 18 at the time and didn't have her own bills to pay. Danielle kept getting on Carol's case about not having a job, but Carol said she couldn't because of the name issue. They ended up getting evicted due to failure to pay rent because Danielle's job wasn't enough to pay for a luxury apartment and she had to move in with grandma. Danielle later lost her job during COVID and has been unemployed ever since. There's way too many scenarios about how Danielle would take advantage of her own daughter, but I don't want to bore you guys with the details. Anyway, on to the story. Back in late 2021, while me and Carol were engaged, she wanted to join the US Navy. She got her name changed back to her father's last name on social security to match her birth certificate and even gave her recruiter child custody papers to prove her name. She enlisted, got through basic, completed her A schooling and got her orders to serve on a ship. We got married in September 2022 before she was shipped to Virginia for her new orders. While Carol was serving and I spent time packing my belongings to move out to Virginia myself, I learned that Danielle was going to therapy to possibly move on. Or so I imagined. I tried so dang hard to stay away from her during that time. But she was always bugging me, wondering why Carol wasn't talking to her during the day. I let her know on repeated occasions that she has no cell service on her ship, but to her, it was just one of those in one ear and right out the other things. I eventually made it to Virginia in December of 2022 to be with Carol. We've been ignoring all of Danielle's calls for a while. Fast forward to April. Carol gets a text from Danielle asking her to call her to talk. They talk on the phone for a while and Carol learns that her grandma is not doing well. I also get my brother's high school graduation invitation in the mail and I want to see him graduate in May, which means Carol wants to see her grandma because she fears that she may not make it to the end of 2023. Danielle seemed to be super nice and Carol and I both thought she changed because of all the therapy that she's been getting. So last week we fly back to Colorado and Danielle loads us her car while we're there and was being way too nice to us like a decent human. So we see my brother walk across the stage and Carol gets to see her grandma. While there, we learn that grandma wants to move into a more safer place with Carol's aunt because of her health. And Danielle has to move somewhere else because in her eyes, everyone doesn't want to take me in because the family doesn't like me. We told her that if we weren't living in a 650 square foot one bedroom apartment on the other side of the country, then we could help her. Again, she starts being even nicer to us while still in Colorado. I even warned Carol that her being nice could mean something bad in the future, given her past behavior. Carol agreed. A few days after we flew back to Virginia, which was just five days ago, Carol gets a text from Danielle saying that she's going to have to live in her car because nobody will help her. Carol asked her why she can't get a job and get her own apartment and she said that I can't get a job at my age and it's been too long and it's very expensive to live on your own, especially in Colorado. Carol told her that we unfortunately can't help her because one, we live in a small apartment and two, we live seven states away on the other side of the country. So now here we are today. I'm at work and I get a call from Carol saying that she needs to be with me. I ask if everything's okay because I can tell that she's not. She said she'd talk about it when she got there. 30 minutes later, she shows up and I go on my lunch break with her. She tells me that her mum literally asked for $1,000 to help her move from Colorado to Virginia so that she could be with us. $1,000! We told her multiple times that we couldn't help her because we don't have that kind of room. We let alone don't have $1,000 to just give away. We live paycheck to paycheck. I was so flabbergasted. And Carol told me that her being super, super nice in recent times was way too good to be true, which is what I felt would happen. She either didn't get the therapy she needed or she lied. I don't know what the case was there because there's no proof. 
Now, I wasn't around for this part, but Carol and Danielle argued over the phone. More like cussing each other out, per se. Daniel was upset with Carol for not providing a home for her when she did it for her first 20 years of life, and now Carol can't return the favor. Carol then told her mother, just F off already, before hanging up and blocking her completely. So, Danielle is now homeless and living in her Nissan Sentra, but we couldn't care less. All those years Carol had to endure due to Danielle's entitled and narcissistic behavior is now biting her in the butt. And nobody wants to live with her because of this. Because that female dog only cares about herself and knows what she's doing is wrong and doesn't give a dang. I personally and honestly don't care if she dies. I will pee on her grave when that happens. Well, there we go. You know what? I would normally say that letting your mother-in-law become homeless, despite how horrible a person they may be, is a pretty terrible thing to do. If you can help, it's always a good thing to do, surely. Even if you don't like them and you don't get on with them. But I think this story is an exception. First of all, you're living paycheck to paycheck anyway, and there's a very limited amount of things that you could do, especially financially. I mean, she's asking for $1,000, which just doesn't exist. Also, it doesn't cost $1,000 to move from Colorado to Virginia. I don't believe that. Secondly, the fact of the matter is, she's been a terrible mother to your wife for her entire childhood. Therefore, even if you had unlimited money, I'd probably say, you know what, fair enough. Don't help her at all. Let her rot and let her be homeless. As horrible as that may sound. I mean, ultimately, this is just payback in its finest form. No one wants her around. I wonder why. Maybe because she's a horrible person. Get nicer and then maybe people will want to help you. That is my solution, Karen. Now for our next entitled parent story. Entitled parents tell me to F off in my own yard? Enjoy your free shower. A few years ago, I lived in a house that was a block away from a public park. It was a very large park and I noticed two soccer games occurring when I left one Saturday to go to the grocery store. When I returned home about 45 minutes later, I saw there was a truck parked beside my property. The occupants of that truck were on my property. There were two children dressed in soccer uniforms, their mum and dad and a large Doberman. The Doberman was lying on a picnic blanket, the parents were setting up their family's picnic lunch and the children were chasing each other all on my front lawn. I couldn't believe my eyes. I pulled my car into my driveway and walked over to the family, asking them why they were on my property. The entitled mother then snarked at me. What does it look like? We're eating lunch. I asked why they're not eating in the public park that's a block away. And she responded, it's more peaceful here. In complete shock, I then said, this is private property and you all need to leave now. The mother's response, go freak yourself, you little dog. I was furious. I pay the mortgage. I do all the lawn work. And you think it's okay to trespass and tell me where to go on my own property? This was the easiest revenge ever. I walked right beside them to the outside tap that was attached to my sprinkler system and turned it on. The family started screaming and grabbed all their stuff as they ran to their truck. The mother and father screamed obscenities the whole time and said they were going to get me. Well, this is where revenge number two came in. I downloaded my security camera footage, which showed their license plate, and I brought it to my next door neighbor, who just happened to be a police officer working that day. The parents were charged with trespassing, and I had a smile on my face for the rest of the day. And there we go. R slash entitled parents, but with a little bit of petty revenge at the same time. Just simple enough. Like, what are you doing? You can't go on someone else's lawn. It's just, it's just illegal. And the least you deserve is to be sprayed off it with a rather beautiful piece of water hosiery. And what a word that is that I've almost definitely just made up. But I love it. Water hosiery, put it in the dictionary. Mother is upset I use my first name in class. I teach philosophy and epistemology to high schoolers. I'm also fairly young for a high school teacher. I introduce myself as Faye, my given first name, which has been my given name since birth to my students. Well, I got an email from a parent reading. Mademoiselle Betancourt, this is Karen and I'm Kevin's mother. I'm deeply disturbed that you allow students to call you by your first name and I believe this is unprofessional and confuses children. My child's test scores clearly reflect this as your class is the only one he is struggling in. And as he has maintained an outstanding academic performance, it is clear that you are the problem. I highly suggest that in order to better teach my child, you reflect on this and begin to use your professional name. So I responded, Karen, thank you for reaching out to me. I'm awfully glad you are so concerned with your child's performance in my class. 
As you might not be aware, I do not grade homework or tests as official standing, and they go only to show an empiricist view of one's performance. Don't worry, this means the grades you see in the system will be different from the final grade, as your child will have a 100% in my class. This was made clear in my syllabus. You should also note that I attach my comments for every assignment and include an annotated copy of your child's exams and essays so that they may see where they need to improve. If you have specifics about concepts your child is struggling with and ways that might better help him learn these concepts, I'd be more than happy to meet with you over coffee or tea to discuss with you. So she responds, the annotations are incredibly vague and abstract and offer little insight into how my child, who is brilliant, may improve. However, I see you mark him wrong every time he refers to you as Mademoiselle Betancourt and replace it with Faye. It is illogical to ask of a child to indulge in using such a silly name. I highly advise you quit marking my child wrong for using your professional name in his essays. Likewise, I believe that as you are his teacher, you should use your professional name. So, I decide to be petty and respond. Thank you for your response. I appreciate how illogical and unsound your argumentation is, as this is a perfect example of Hume's law. I shall be using this to model in class examples of bad argumentation from now on. Thank you for the free class materials. I got a response back from her, but I didn't respond. Okay, and there we go. Just had a look at what Hume's law is, and it's often formulated as one can't derive an ought from an is. So I guess in this situation, the teacher is saying that, yeah, okay, maybe you think that I ought to do something, but that isn't the fact. I, I do what I want. Maybe I'm wrong there. That seems to be what she's saying. Now, as for this story on the whole, I would say that, yeah, it is pretty normal in school. To, to call your teachers by their surnames. However, clearly this teacher, Mademoiselle Betancourt, I mean, to be honest, I shouldn't say that, Faye, has clearly been allowed by her school, by the principal, whatever, to, to call herself, or at least allow her students to call herself by her given name, her first name. Otherwise, she'd be reprimanded, right? I don't imagine there's a way in which the te her other teachers, her colleagues, the principal, her head of year, whatever, know that she, or don't know that she is calling herself Faye, and like, oh, we didn't realize this. Every other teacher calls themselves by their surnames. I imagine that everyone knows that she does this, and she's been allowed to do this. Therefore, if you're allowed to do it and you want to do it, that's fine, right? If anything, I would say that it's more friendly with your students and you probably have a better rapport. I don't know, if it works for Faye, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it, right? I don't really care what my child or children call their teachers as long as it's with respect and the teacher allows it. To be honest though, I do feel a little bit bad for Kevin. If he's used to calling other teachers Miss this or Sir or Mr. whatever, and it's just this one teacher, Faye, that he has to change for, I don't think he should be marked down for that. I'm not sure if he is, but I don't know. It's, it's a weird one, isn't it? For Faye, I get that. She wants to be called by Faye. And by the way, this, the mother does not need to be involved in this at all. This is clearly a Karen. However, for Kevin, I don't know. Seems a little bit harsh. Yes, even though the teacher is telling him, call me this. I don't know. He might feel like he has to call you Miss Betancourt or Mademoiselle Betancourt. I don't know. It's a tough one. I don't. I wouldn't blame necessarily Kevin here. But for Karen getting involved, yes, there is absolutely no need. And now for our final entitled parent story of this episode. Entitled mother tried to reduce my pay for attempting to seduce her husband. I started babysitting families in my church growing up. Between the ages of 12 to 16, I babysat for over 30 families, and I was highly requested in that community. I knew everyone, and I attended that church since I was four. Everyone knew me, I knew everyone, very tight knit. So I babysat for a family we will call the Smiths. I knew that family since I was 10, and they had children that were younger than me. I helped with these kids for children's mass. Now I knew the family, and we were kind of close because I was one of the kids' helpers in a class unit. Plus, we all knew each other from the church and school. Now, I'm 13-ish when this happened. I babysat for this family, the Smiths, and it was going good. They had a pool in their backyard, and the dad had told me to pack a bathing suit. He said, The kids will probably beg you to swim with them, if you don't mind, but you don't have to. So, I babysat these kids for about five hours. Knowing that four hours in, the husband would come home to take a work call. Then he'd help with the kids and my parents would take me home. 20 minutes before the dad gets home, the kids want to swim. I agree and we all get ready. I'd chosen a normal bathing suit for a 13 year old, but I had a larger chest than others my age and the mum of these kids. Now the dad comes home and asks if things are all good. I tell him yes and he tells me he'll find us when he's done with his work call. It's about 5 p.m. and he comes out and asks to take another call. 
He asked to take a picture to send to his wife to let her know that I'll watch the kids for longer since he had another call. TLDR, all went well till the wife shows up. Everything goes good and the kids are having a blast. I help dry them off, help them shower and change as the wife gets ready to take over and the husband has started making dinner. I was in my oversized shirt bringing the kids downstairs when the wife signals to me. She pulls me aside and begins to shame me. She tells me I won't be getting paid from 4 p.m. to 5.45 p.m. for dressing like a slut in an attempt to stray her husband from me. What? That my choice of swimsuit was slutty and she should have known better not to trust me. That I was a, I don't know if I can even say that word, and that my breasts would get me nowhere in life and I was going to be odd dressing like that. Okay, wow. I was flabbergasted because I'm barely 13 at the time and I wasn't wearing a revealing swimsuit. I nod and profusely apologize because I wore this to the pool and never had any problems and me and my bestie had matching ones. I was sobbing hysterically. I took my money and sat on the porch waiting for my mum to pick me up. I hear yelling inside. The dad comes out and gives me $50 and goes back to yelling at his wife inside the house. Oh, there's also some extra information at the bottom of this. They filed for divorce because she was having an affair with another guy. She later revealed this information to another family that I babysat for and they told me that the wife was insecure about her chest. The dad was not a pedo and his kids are doing great. Oh my goodness. Well, I don't want to say save the best till last, but let's just say save the most extreme till last. Uh, goodness me. Imagine being that insecure about yourself that you're getting jealous of a 13-year-old child. I mean, I don't quite know what to say other than that is actually so embarrassing that it's, it's bordering on abusive because you're, you're telling a 13 year old that they're going to get odd if they wear stuff like that. I mean, that's that's not really just insecure, is it? That's very harmful to someone's future. Karen preaches to my child. My eldest is having a play date with a friend and her mum comes to pick her up. I'm in my bedroom with Streetlight Manifesto playing and my boyfriend watching the kids. He comes to get me, saying that Mummy Dearest wants to talk to me about my music and rolls his eyes. So I go and she immediately starts with the You let your children listen to such blasphemy! And I tell her it's really not blasphemy if we don't believe in God. She then gets so outraged that we need to see the light. So I snap back at her. Leave my house immediately or I will have my boyfriend assist you in finding your way to the exit. I send her an email the next morning. Hi Emily, this is Fama. I'm very concerned about your insistence on my preaching to my children and do not appreciate you insulting me and my children, especially not in front of my child. I would very much like for you to keep your religion to yourself and your family. If you find what you need in your God, that is wonderful for you and I'm truly happy for you, but we do not share your beliefs and we very much do not want you pushing your beliefs on us and especially not our children, who do not yet possess the critical faculties to understand such difficult concepts. As a courtesy, I will refrain from playing atheist music while your child is over. I got a message back. Fama, I'm very sorry for my attitude the other day. My mother's currently in the hospital and I wasn't having a great day. I understand you have a difference of beliefs and will respect that in the future. Thank you for coming to me instead of just attacking me. So, I think it's settled, and I let my daughter go to her play date despite my boyfriend wanting to chaperone. I should have let him. When I pick up my child, we start driving home, and I ask what they did and if she had fun, and she says, We watched a movie about Jesus. Luckily, my child already knows about Christianity and that they have their beliefs, but that we, mummy and daddy, do not share those beliefs. But now, I have to figure out how I'm going to answer the but why questions from a five-year-old that I was hoping I could put off until she was better equipped to understand apologia and its critiques because I don't have any real issues with Christians or Christianity that aren't based in the logical failings of their arguments for the existence of God. I became an atheist because I studied philosophy. So I sent another email to Emily. Emily, this is Famer. Please explain to me why you thought it appropriate after our last conversation to proselytize to my child. Here is the response. Famer, I'm sorry. I figured you wouldn't mind giving you espouse the virtues of atheism in your home that I at least provide a counter to your blasphemy. Children should be allowed to decide whichever path they wish on their own. Emily, I responded. Thank you for responding. 
I will no longer be letting my child over to your house unsupervised and your child is no longer welcome over at ours unsupervised. I'll be taking further actions as necessary through the school. I advise you don't weaponize your child in this and allow them to continue to be friends. However, should you fail this, I will seek a no contact order and go to the police to report your harassment. Any further correspondence can go through my boyfriend as frankly, you don't want my patience to run any thinner than it already is. His contact information is attached and I've CC'd him to this thread now. We haven't heard back. Well, I hope after that threat, I mean, it's so ridiculous that you even need to make that threat of your boyfriend getting involved, that that is going to be the end of that story. And it certainly looks as if it is. But yeah, overall, I will say I completely agree with you, OP. It's one thing having your own beliefs and your own religion. And I'm completely here for that. And as you said yourself, if you believe in whatever you believe in, that is completely fine. And genuinely, yeah, I'm happy for people that have their beliefs in whatever they believe in. It's all good with me. But once you start forcing and pushing those beliefs onto other people's children, yeah, that I don't really agree with. Now, moving on to our next entitled parent story. Now, I will give a little bit of a warning before we get into this one. It's a little bit graphic, perhaps, um, if you're not very good with blood or bodily fluids or that sort of stuff. Maybe you want to avoid and just skip to the, the third story of this episode. But it's a really good story, to be honest, and a serious story and one that I wanted to cover and show you guys. So if you're keen, here we go. My mum, a 41 year old woman, believes me, a minor under the age of 17, vomiting blood and having violent diarrhea is because I don't exercise enough. I am currently sitting on the toilet writing this in incredible pain. Yesterday night, I was sent to the ER because my stomach was in serious pain. I came back with violent diarrhea and I ended up vomiting blood all over my floor. My mum claims that she cannot take care of it and that I should be able to when I'm literally pooping blood. She's been told multiple times for over a year to take me to a gastrointestinal specialist because I'm suffering symptoms of something chronic, but she will not take me. She believes that it is my fault I am this way when I try my absolute best to take care of myself when suffering from severe mental illness. She took them saying that I should see a specialist as a F you I was right on her part and is claiming that if I just ate better, I'd be fine. She is aware I'm recovering from an eating disorder and before that ever started, I had serious stomach issues. Last night, I threw up blood and bile onto my room floor and I'm unaware how to clean it, being that the smell would most likely make me vomit again. It's a genuine biohazard, but she has forbidden me from cleaning it myself, saying that she doesn't want to deal with me asking how and that she'll get it. But she said this last night, and now, almost 10, she's not remotely began to help clean it or tell me how to clean it. I cannot change clothes because it's in my room. I cannot sleep because it's in my room. I cannot put on pants because it's in my room. And when I ask her to just tell me how to clean it, she refuses. I don't know what to do at this point, and it's gotten to a point that the pain in my stomach will temporarily paralyze my limbs and cause me to go unconscious. No matter how bad it gets, she always ends up saying that there's no way I can have these health problems because I'm too young. When she's the one that goes to the doctor for a minor headache, but won't take her child to a doctor, despite being repeatedly referred by doctors to do so. I'm scared for my life, as the pain gets worse by the day, and I'm barely even digesting food anymore. I cannot even drink water without risking my body rejecting it. Okay, so this is pretty much just abuse. Anyone got any, uh, anyone got any contrasting opinions? Leave them in the comments down below. I doubt it though. It literally is just abuse of your child. Is it not? Am I wrong? Am I missing something? It is. I mean, like you're vomiting blood and saying, first of all, let's not go to the doctor or A&E. And second of all, let's not even bother cleaning it up, guys. Let's just leave it there. That was your fault. I want you to deal with it but I'm not even gonna tell you how. Such good parenting. Ugh, let's carry on. Now for our third entitled parent story of this episode. How my wife ruined her mum's mother's day by treating her like a mum. My mother-in-law is an annoying person to say in the nicest way. She has extremely low self-worth and she compensates that by forcing the world to go around her. As family who interact with her regularly, we're forced to treat her like a queen every day, every minute. If we don't, then there will be drama all the way from pouting, going to her room, fainting, leaving the house to full blown breakdown, including saying, why should I live on this planet anymore if no one cares about me? Yeah, to see an old lady say she'll kill herself just because we don't give her a few minutes of attention is a bizarre thing to witness. So it's exhausting to be around her, but what else can my wife and my sister-in-law do? 
She is their mum, and they both try their darn best to make her feel special But they'd also like to interact with her as their mum too Not just as some out-of-touch royalty They would like to crack jokes chat about general things and share their problems Not having to be constantly worried what statement might tick her off when they were kids in her orbits Things were fine as she controlled them and that made her feel as though she was the center of attention But now that they're married have family of their own and that she is not the anchor of the family She started becoming more and more demanding that we perform some elaborate rituals to make her feel special It's becoming extremely exhausting. So on to the actual event itself My mother-in-law and father-in-law have traveled to our country and are staying with us for a short time to help us with the kids As we all live halfway across the globe My wife planned an elaborate mother's day event centered around my mother-in-law even though she herself is a mum too One of those that included lunch in a popular ethnic cuisine restaurant by the way, had she not planned it herself, there would have been a snarky comment at the end of the day saying, Seems like you don't care about your mum enough to plan something for me. I was waiting the whole day for you to do something. Anyway, morning went uneventfully as we've been pampering the grown-up toddler, and my mother-in-law was quite jubilant. We go to the restaurant, and I and our elder one go in to set up the table as my wife is bringing the others in, my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and our little one. My two-year-old, the real toddler, decides to throw a tantrum for toddler reasons, but then my mother-in-law sees this beautiful garden in front of the restaurant and wants my wife to take her picture. My mother-in-law doesn't care about anything and forces my wife to take several pictures as my wife is holding a crying, fussing, and kicking toddler at her hip. Having basked in the glory of being the center of attention, my mother-in-law is satisfied enough and they all come in. My wife is ticked off from that, but tries her best to be cheerful. The waiter comes in to take the order, and right then, my mother-in-law decides to go to the restroom. My wife asks her to order before going, as the kids will get hangry if we wait for long. But the big mistake my wife did was she asked in a normal tone, a regular conversational tone, instead of a pleading or pleasing pampering tone. How dare we order her royalty on what to do? That was strike one. As me and my wife are looking at the bazillion choices and trying to order for kids, ourselves, spice level, etc, etc, we got absorbed into ordering without paying attention to the most important person. My mother-in-law wasn't the center of attention for two full minutes. How dare we? That is strike two. We didn't notice that or ask what she wants. She asked if they have a particular ethnic dish, which is a regular staple we have almost every day at home, like a grilled cheese sandwich. That too in an indifferent meek tone She was indirectly implying that she's just a nobody because of strike one and two and therefore she was ordering some peasant food That was our cue to realize our mistake Prostrate before her beg her forgiveness and bring the world back into alignment before things go downhill We failed to notice that change in her tone, which was strike three instead my wife suggests mum We have that almost every day at home. So why don't you but my mother-in-law cuts her off saying i know that are you saying i don't know that and then storms to the restroom we're all figuring out what the frick happened and we finish ordering my mother-in-law comes back and unloads on my wife how she has disrespected her we brought her to this country and ever since then my wife has made it her mission to do nothing but continuously humiliate her and then she starts crying i quickly realized what had conspired but my innocent wife whose heart is only filled with love and not such evil games doesn't realize drama that my mother-in-law wants instead she's trying to understand how suggesting that the dish is a regular staple at home is humiliating and my mother-in-law goes you're implying i'm dumb and don't even know this you have ruined mother's day all daughters do special things on mother's day and here you are ruining mine with a few other delectable quotes. My wife says again and again, that's just a regular thing to say to your mum. But my mother-in-law is adamant that my wife humiliated her by implying that she is dumb for not knowing it's a staple dish we regularly eat at home. So she storms off to sit outside. Seriously, that was the entire discussion for a full five minutes. It was extremely bizarre to see a 60-year-old woman throw a tantrum and accuse her daughter because she said, it's a regular staple we eat at home. Now, normally we would run after her and apologize and beg her to come back and keep apologizing throughout lunch, which is what she wanted after three strikes. But this time we were so over this BS, having been through similar ones so many times. So we just sat and ate in peace without an extra side of drama. But my wife was heartbroken 
She'd done all this planning, wanted to be a good daughter, wanted her mum to feel special, and in the end has ruined Mother's Day by talking to her mum as a mum and not as a royal. So, a 60-year-old woman started crying in the middle of lunch rush in a popular restaurant, all because we didn't give her attention for five minutes while busy ordering food for our kids. There are hundreds of other similar stories, but this is one of the clearest what the frick just happened. Honestly, guys, if I had someone like that in my family, I think I'd just have to retire and say, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I actually just don't even want to be affiliated with you in any single way anymore. You are that annoying. Why is a 60-year-old woman acting like the youngest at that table when there is also a two-year-old there? I mean, whose tantrum was worse? Genuinely, the two-year-olds who was tantruming because they're a toddler or a 60-year-old woman's because your daughter asked you a question like, what is actually going on you just know exactly what sort of person she is like i don't even have to meet this person to know exactly how they function day to day as op said thinking the entire world revolves around them but just being so annoying and just like precious and almost like a princess i mean is describing her as royalty is absolutely perfect that is exactly how she thinks she is that everyone should bow down to her she needs a you know a taste of her own medicine i don't know exactly what that would entail if you have any ideas comment down below how does op and his family how do we let this woman or make this woman realize that she is so so entitled i want to hear your thoughts step monster tried to kidnap me and my sister for christmas this happened in 2009 when i was 15 and my sister was 11. i honestly don't remember it well i had to call my mother to fill me in on some details and it helped a little my parents got divorced when i was 10. my mother got primary custody but we stayed with my father for about three days a week sometimes more they took turns celebrating the holidays with us We'd spend them with one parent in one year and with the other one the next. In March 2009, my father and his then girlfriend, Molly, broke up after he confessed to cheating with the woman that eventually became my stepmom. Years later, I found out that the affair had been going on for almost two years by the time he told Molly. He introduced stepmom to us in May, on my birthday, actually, and they almost immediately announced their engagements. From that moment, she started trying to force us all to be a happy blended family, which usually meant forcing us to do everything she, or sometimes my stepbrother, wanted, and pretending my mum wasn't in the picture. Stepmum and my dad started pushing her to leave us with them a lot more often than my parents had previously agreed, but she thankfully wouldn't budge. We started getting ready for the holidays in November, and stepmum started talking about a ski resort that she wanted to visit with us. It was a three-hour car drive from where we lived and was clearly more suited for couples, younger children, or the elderly. Neither me or my sister actually wanted to go. But before we could say that, stepmom asked us when we'd be done with my school so that she could book it for a two-week trip during our winter break. I was happy to be the one to break it to her. We'd spent Christmas and New Year's Day with my father and Molly the year before, so it was mum's turn to have us. My father and stepmom called my mother dozens of times to try to convince her to let them take us, insisting that stepmom was excited to spend Christmas with us and that the previous year's holidays didn't count because we'd spent them with Molly. My mum said no as she'd already made plans and the subject was dropped for a few weeks. Then, on our last day of school before winter break, stepmom picked me and my sister up from our schools. That was fine. We were supposed to spend a couple of days with my father before the holidays. What wasn't fine was that the moment we got into her car, stepmom said, We're going to the ski resort! Surprise! She proceeded to tell us that they'd already packed our bags for us and dad would meet us there. I asked if my mum knew about this and she said, Sure, but I knew that was a lie. I also didn't believe her when she said we'd only be there for a couple of days and would be back before Christmas. I figured they'd book the two week stay they wanted and would probably guilt trip us both into staying once their couple of days were up. I was terrified. I didn't have a phone. My mum thought I was still too young to have one. Didn't trust my stepmom and I could see that my sister was even more scared. I told my stepmom we didn't want to go. She said, Fine, let's just pick your stepbrother up from school. We picked him up from school and then stepmom said, Okay, now let's go to the resort. I said again that we didn't want to go. She said, fine, let's just find a gas station and fill up. That pattern repeated itself about six times over the next hour. Every time I said we didn't want to go, she'd make an excuse and pretend to forget my plea. As we were about to leave town, my dad called stepmom. I heard them fight for a few minutes about something and then she hung up. My stepbrother asked her what happened, but she didn't answer. Then she said, 
I'm taking you kids to your mum's. She turned the car around and took us home. When we got there, my mum pulled us out of the car and screamed at my stepmom to leave, which she did. Mum was hugging us and bawling as if she hadn't seen us in years. She didn't tell me the full story until a few days later. Basically, my mum called my dad in panic because he'd never told her we'd gotten home, which he always did whenever he picked us up from school. He was hoping she wouldn't call until we were already at the resort. My father knew that lying would do more harm than good, so he told her their plans. He tried to spin it around as something my sister wanted, but my mother didn't buy it. She told him that if stepmom didn't take us back to her place, she'd call the police. My father and stepmom took my stepbrother to the resort. For a few months after, they bragged about all the fun they had and all the things that me and my sister had missed. My stepbrother later confided in me that he actually hated it. He barely saw his mum while they were there, and he spent Christmas mostly alone in their room. Stepmum called us both selfish for trying to ruin their holidays. My sister actually felt guilty for a while, and I had to reassure her. My mum didn't call the cops or press charges. At the time, she didn't know if what stepmum did would qualify as a crime or if they'd actually help. She also feared that that would ruin our relationship with my father, with whom she was still trying to stay on amicable terms. Years later, she told me she regretted not calling anyone. And that's the story of how I got my first phone. For some reason, I really hate this story. So much that I avoid talking about it. This text was actually in my notes for almost a week. It's far from the worst thing my stepmom has ever done, but it still angers me. I admit that writing it all down did help a little though. Wow, what a mental start to the episode. I don't know the laws here. And guys, if you do know the laws and the legalities of this, please do get in the comments down below and help me out. But surely this must be illegal, right? It must go down to custodian laws or something. If you have an agreement put in place contractually, with your ex or the person that you were you know with when you had this child and then you're now split up from then you can't just go against that i don't i don't see how you can do that that has to be illegal it literally has to be otherwise what's the point in custody ever now i kind of get what your mum's saying maybe she didn't realize exactly what would happen or if the police would listen but yeah there has to be some repercussions for doing this you can't just say uh you know what i don't care that my now husband had a different wife or different girlfriend last year uh that's that's i don't care about that i'm now gonna have his kids for this christmas and gonna steal them away from their mum for two weeks like i just don't see how that can be legal let me know down below nonetheless it's extremely immoral i mean that's clear and um yeah i now see why you call this woman step monster now for our second entitled parent story of this episode my toddler's shoes don't match his underwear heresy So I've said in a few previous posts that I used to work in childcare and as such have a few good stories This happened a few years ago and so some details are foggy But i'll do my best to get the important bits across clearly The childcare center I worked at was divided into two floors Infants and toddlers downstairs and three-year-olds and up upstairs I was working downstairs in a toddler room when I met the entitled parents of this story To set the stage their childcare was subsidized, meaning that the state paid for most, if not all of it. I also knew through conversation that their housing was also subsidized. They were on food stamps, etc., etc. Basically, if there was a financial aid system active in the state, they weren't receiving it. I don't say this to disparage anyone who needs those services, but to point out the absurdity of their lifestyle. They drove a Mercedes and a BMW, both new. They wore gold and precious stones, expensive clothes, never the same outfit twice, always had fresh haircuts, and the entitled mum in particular took great pride in her long, gaudy nails. I'm not sure how they could afford all of these luxuries and still qualify for government-assisted. Everything, considering they were both unemployed. I suspect the entitled dad dealt illicit substances, but since I lack concrete evidence, I won't get into that. Apparently, they wanted these traits to rub off on their son, who we'll call Adam. As a two-year-old, Adam wore brand name clothes, new outfits every day, had professionally styled buzz cuts and diamond studs in his ears. The earliest story of insanity I can recall from these people was only a few days after their care started. We asked parents to have a few spare changes of clothes for our younger kids, who on occasion needed them for obvious reasons. This entitled mum was happy to oblige with several full outfits, not just pants, shirts, socks, and underwear, mind you, full outfits pants shirts socks underwear belts shoes hats accessories pretty sure we could have found the kitchen sink in there if we looked hard enough 
Naturally, him being a toddler, he did what toddlers are wont to do and had an accident one morning. It wasn't serious, just needed some new undies and pants. So we gave him just that and he went about his day being an ordinary human child. However, when his entitled mum came to pick him up that afternoon, she took it upon herself to very loudly and forcefully educate all of us that when one piece of the outfit needs to be changed, everything changes. And that in future, she wants us to change him into whole new sets of clothes every time he needs to be changed regardless of how minor it is. I'm sure there's more tales of toddler Adam's entitled mum to tell. Like that time she threw a torrential fit that one of his diamond earrings went missing because, duh, toddlers will play with piercings. But I went back to working upstairs with the older kids shortly after that and wouldn't be reintroduced to the entitled mum for about another year until Adam came up and became part of my group again. And things went from mildly annoying to just kind of sad. The first thing we repeatedly tried to bring to their attention were issues with Adam's sight. He had at least one lazy eye and it was pretty severe. During each of his yearly vision screenings, held at the center for all the kids, the nurse would always recommend that he be taken to an optometrist, as the problem could be corrected since he was still young. But no, my son ain't wearing no glasses was all we ever got out of the entitled mum when we broached the issue. Because of his impaired vision, coupled with the fact that his home life consisted of sitting in front of a TV or phone all the time, he began to fall behind developmentally. There was nothing wrong with his cognitive abilities. In fact, I actually think he could be quite smart when he wanted to be. But it was just very clear that his parents saw him as nothing more than an accessory to dress up and post pictures of on Facebook. So even as a three-year-old, he just didn't care. He wouldn't engage during activities, was very unsociable, and constantly sought attention through disruptive or destructive means. He wasn't a bad kid, there's no such thing, but he had a lot of problems that his parents' negligence made worse by the day. The one point that I'll never forget was one day, one of our activities was getting all the kids in his age group to write the letters of their name in order. And while most kids were able to do at least some of it, Adam was still at a point where he didn't even know what letters were in his name. Or maybe he did, but his motivation to do anything was just non-existent. So being about as stubborn as he was, I sat with him all that afternoon going over it with him. The letters in his name and the motions to write them on paper. And I wasn't going to stop until something happened. And at some point, it did. Eventually, he was able to write a great big letter A on a piece of paper all by himself And I'll never forget the look on his face when he realized what he'd done It was like he instantly became a whole different kid Not someone sitting with his arms crossed staring blankly at the table Happy to wait until you got bored of trying to help and moved on He was beaming ear to ear Holding the paper up to me and proudly proclaiming A for Adam A for Adam After a few high fives, he was more than happy to spend the rest of that afternoon practicing his A's. And we were both excited to show his mum what a great job he did when she came to pick him up. "Uh Uh-huh. That's cool, honey. Let's go. She didn't even look down from her phone. And I've never seen a kid look more disappointed since. This kind of behavior continued until their care eventually ended. I don't remember the exact reason, but they weren't kicked out or anything. And even after... One day, weeks after they were no longer with us, I answer a call from the entitled mum out of the blue, demanding her tax papers. Now, when you have a kid or kids in childcare, you get some kind of form every year to file with the rest of your taxes for something or other. I wasn't an office worker, so I don't know the details. What I do know is that we're not the ones who provide those forms, so we don't have anything for her. This answer does not appease her as she just keeps demanding over and over again that we give her her tax papers. We're withholding them, we're stealing from her, yada yada. After informing her for the sixth or seventh time that we can't help her as we don't have her tax information, she just tells me that she'll be there in 10 minutes to take them herself. Before I can even tell her not to, she's hung up. True to her word, she's in the building 10 minutes later, coming into the office and demanding that we give her those tax papers that we don't even have and threatening to get physical if we don't. Having had enough of her malarkey, I tell her flat out that she's no longer enrolled at this center and has no business on the premise. 
and it's not until I'm dialing 911 that she finally leaves. I call the non-emergency line anyway to report what happened just to be safe though. Yeah, so anyway, she was arrested for robbery and assault yesterday. So that's why I thought I'd share a few stories. Sorry, what? You can't, you can't just come along out of nowhere and just say that at the end. I mean, yeah, she was a pretty crazy mother this entire time, but I thought she was just entitled. I don't think she was actually going to get arrested. What? Uh, <sighs> Goodness me. I mean, look, a truly terrible person. It's pretty clear to see, but uh, uh, yeah, just didn't expect that ending. I've got to say, I really just feel so bad for the kid. Like, it's not his fault that he's been so badly treated and his parents, or at least clearly his mum's lack of enthusiasm for his life in general, outside of literally just being a doll, as you said, OP, is just so sad, as, as you said. It's just an incredibly sad story. That one moment where he saw joy in learning for the first time, writing that a out after you had to toil and work hard to even get him to write the letter a at that age was was so nice to see but yet yeah, all taken away by the negligence of an entitled parent entitled mum wanted my baby to trap her boyfriend i've been sitting on this one for a while and it was the tipping point that led to me going no contact with my entitled mum a few years ago after dropping out of college and having to move back in with my entitled mum financial reasons stemming from my mother i found out i was pregnant five months pregnant 19 and single scary right so i went to my mother and told her because i didn't really know what else to do the first thing out of her mouth verbatim was oh this is perfect can i have it obviously i thought i heard her wrong or that she was just screwing with me because what but no i'd heard her perfectly she went on about how she thought her new boyfriend was going to break up with her and that since he was a widow, his wife and child had died in childbirth, he wouldn't leave her if she got pregnant. On the spot, she pitched this elaborately stupid plan of us hiding my pregnancy and then passing my baby off as her own, as if we didn't live in the same city as all our family. Basically, I told her she was crazy and we went back and forth for a bit before she threw a full-blown tantrum, screaming about how ungrateful I was and why couldn't I just do this one thing for me and she stormed off and locked herself in her room where she promptly went on her phone and aired out my entire situation on facebook well within the hour both sides of my family knew my father equally an entitled jerk but separated from my mother showed up with his girlfriend at my door and informed me that they'd already set up an appointment for the following week with a local adoption agency and that they knew i'd do the right thing which i did by packing my stuff and couch hopping with friends for a bit until I got on my feet. This honestly wasn't the worst thing my entire mum has ever done to me, but it was definitely the turning point to realizing I didn't want or trust her around myself or my child. Anyway, I haven't really talked to or seen either of my parents since, and now I have a charming three-year-old boy and a lovely fiance, so life is much better. That is amazing to hear. Right, okay, fine. Is this the most stupid one so far? Oh, this is perfect. Can I have your baby? How about no? But for a million dollars, yes. Now that didn't actually come into part of this story, but my question to you, OP, is for a million dollars, would you have sold your baby? That has got to be tempting. I know I'd be tempted. In all seriousness, this is a weird story. I don't really know what your mum was actually thinking of this entire time. Do they want you to give your baby up so they could adopt it? I don't really understand what's going on. Like both your parents are just mental. And overall, it's just great that you got out of there. As you can tell, I'm still quite confused. This honestly wasn't the worst thing my entitled mum has ever done to me. Right, so what's she done then? Apart from trying to steal your baby. Things are worse than that? I don't even want to know. I'm joking, I do. Make another post, please, OP. Let's carry on. My aunt stole my inheritance. Then karma struck and her life fell apart. My aunt was one of two kids my grandparents had. My mother was the polar opposite to my aunt. She worked from the age of 12 in my grandfather's shop, never asked for anything, and eventually managed to start her own business. My aunt never held down a job until the age of 26. She was constantly stealing from her parents and was constantly in trouble. Despite this, my aunt was spoiled by my grandmother, and so were her kids. She had three kids from three different men, and her first husband was not one of them, if you know what I mean. It didn't matter what my aunt or her kids did, my grandmother would always always jumped to their defense. She never had time for my mum and her kids unless it was to get something from us. The only reason my mum would visit her was because she loved my grandfather. My grandfather passed away in 2004, and a few months after, my nan decided to write up a new will. My mother and my aunt were both present for it when she signed it, so they knew what was in it. 
It made it so that when she passed away, her home would be sold and the money split 25% each to my mum and aunt and the remaining 50% would go evenly to the grandkids. At the time, the home was worth more than half a million pounds, so it would be a nice little inheritance, but nothing life-changing. In 2010, my mum died after an accident and did not have a current will in place. As she no longer had her business and was renting a house, she didn't have anything of much monetary value. The only thing she was concerned about was what would be done at her funeral should she pass away, but she told me everything she wanted. The music, the flowers, the coffin color, and even what people were to wear at the funeral. She wanted people to wear bright, warm colors. So when she passed, my aunt and nan took over all the arrangements and tried to undo all the things I told them. The songs were going to be songs I knew mum didn't like. The flowers were all the wrong colors and they picked a hideous coffin. With the help of my siblings, we were able to change a few of the things back to what they were supposed to be. But the coffin couldn't be changed for some reason. And my nan refused to let people come dressed as clowns. So it was all black. It was frustrating. After the funeral, my nan had her will changed. My siblings and I were told by our aunt that she didn't have any involvement with the writing of the will. And our nan told us that she changed it so that mum's share would go to her kids instead. All good, we thought. After mum passed away, my nan just stopped talking about my mum. At first, we thought it was because she was still recovering from losing her daughter. But even five years after mum passed, she still wouldn't talk about her. Even if you brought up a story about my mum, Nan would very obviously try and change the subject, usually about how hard my aunt and her trashy kids had it. And if you went to talk about your own problems, she would somehow bring it back to my aunt. I suffered a mental breakdown after my mum's death, so you can imagine how much it hurt to hear, well, X has had it so much worse. In 2016, my Nan passed away. She'd written down what she wanted to be done for her funeral And it was basically all the same things that she'd picked out for my mum's funeral Even the music to be played I don't know why she tried to have a dress rehearsal funeral Using my mum as the stand-in But it was obvious that that's what she was trying to do So after a couple of months Our siblings and I were waiting to hear about the will reading And my aunt kept telling me Oh, it will be another month before we can do the reading I didn't mind I wasn't fussed about the money, to be honest But my oldest brother was hoping to use the money to pay for a honeymoon for him and his then fiance And my younger brother was about to start uni So it would have been one heck of a help Eventually my dad bumped into the solicitor my grandmother had used to deal with her will and asked what was happening The solicitor let slip that the will had already been read and that it left everything to my aunt When my dad questioned this, the solicitor told him that my aunt had been present when the will was written, despite promising that she had nothing to do with it. When confronted, my aunt initially tried to deny, but eventually admitted to lying to all of us. She showed us the will and it confirmed what we already knew. The house and all its contents were now my aunt's. This included my granddad's war medals he fought in the Second World War. When I told her that he'd promised them to me before he died, she said... Well, unless you have it in writing, you will have nothing in this house. Anyway, I already gave them to Clive. My heart sank. Clive, not his real name obviously, was her eldest son and the dictionary definition of a screw up. He'd been in and out of prison for stealing and dealing drugs. I knew that the moment that idiot got his hands on my granddad's medals, they would have been sold off. We looked into taking her to court over the will, but everyone we spoke to said that we probably wouldn't get anything out of it. She immediately put the house up for sale at close to three quarters of a million pounds. She'd angered too many people in our town, so she was going to sell the house and move closer to her daughter, who lives in a big city. An offer was made on the house and she put down a deposit on a house near the big city. And I thought that was that. Here's where karma comes into play. The people who wanted my nan's house had a survey done on the house to see if there were issues. And oh boy, there were. It turns out that the land the house was built on was way too soft for the type of house it was. And it was sinking. It sunk about two centimeters in the 40 plus years my nan and granddad had lived there. But the sinking was accelerating to one centimeter per year. This meant that within the next three years, the house would need some serious work or be knocked down. The new value of the house? Just £60,000. Therefore, the buyers immediately pulled out, having not even put down a deposit. She couldn't buy her new house, but still had to pay the deposit on it. And while this was happening, she let Clive move in with her into her house that she rented from the council. 
He wasn't allowed to live in any of the council houses because he trashed every single one he'd ever been given. Somebody reported this and she was kicked out of her home. She was forced to move into my nan's old home as she couldn't live anywhere else. So there she is living in a crumbling house with her idiot son and her partner. She was stuck there for two years. Every time I saw her, she'd try and start talking to me and I would just ignore her and walk off. One time as I was walking away, she screamed, Your mother deserved to die for having a R word like you in the middle of a busy street. Someone reported her to the police and she had an official warning from them and was ridiculed on Facebook. Every time I saw her after that, she looked more and more miserable. Eventually, she sold the house for something like £85,000 and moved in with her daughter in the big city. I lost contact with her and her kids after this. I thought karma had been issued. Oh, but karma still wasn't done with her. I bumped into one of her former friends and she told me what happened after she left our town. She moved into her daughter's home, let's call her Sue, but they only had a three bedroom house and three kids. My aunt and her partner had to live in the smallest room in the house while my aunt looked for a job and a home to rent. Even with £85,000 cash, she couldn't afford a home anywhere. After about a month, my aunt's partner ran off after emptying her account. She was left stranded in Sue's house, not contributing anything because all the money she makes goes into bingo. Eventually, Sue and my aunt get into a screaming match and my aunt says something along the lines of, I should have aborted you. Sue immediately kicked her out of her house. So again, there's my aunt in a city where she knows nobody, no money, no home, and the last bridge she had, a smoldering wreck. Last anyone has heard, she was living in a caravan in the roughest part of the city and she can no longer work because she's suffering early onset arthritis and can no longer move her hands. I know I shouldn't get joy out of something like this happening to another person, but it does bring me some peace as to what happened. Wow, before we got into the end of that story, I was thinking, okay, that is some pretty good karma. I'm happy that everything seems to have evened itself out. And then there was another paragraph and it kept going and going. And honestly, I loved every second of it. I mean, look, stealing someone's inheritance is one thing, but things like those war medals that have obviously been sold, you're never gonna get them back. Those are memories that have no price. You cannot put a price on them they are so special to you and they've gone i mean that if anything is worth all that karma alone and look i'll say this karma is a but then again so is your aunt so it seems completely fair to me now if you like stolen inheritance stories you're gonna want to stay tuned because i've got another one for you Mum wants me to sign over 250,000 beneficiary check. My dad passed away recently and it came to light that he named me as one of the beneficiaries on his life insurance policy. My mum says that it was a mistake and that I'm not supposed to be a beneficiary, just her. She wants me to file for the money and sign the check over to her. I'm going to go through with it because she is my mum and blah blah whatever. But the insulting part is that my mum says I can keep $5,000 from it to throw my wedding. I only have 2,000 from my own money because my partner and I are kind of broke. Is she being entitled or am I or both of us? Okay, wow, this is one of the craziest posts I've ever read. OP couldn't possibly be less understanding of the situation. I don't want to be harsh, but that is the truth. But thankfully, there is an update which we're going to get straight into and hopefully some sense has come into OP's head or at least someone has told them what they really should be doing here. Oh boy, well, some updates are due. First of all, thank you all for your concern and comments in my first post. It was helpful to hear your perspective on the money and it definitely changed my view of the whole situation. To recap quickly, my dad passed away and he named me as a beneficiary on his life insurance policy. My mum said it was a mistake and that I'm not supposed to be a beneficiary, just her. So she wants me and my brother to file for the money and then sign the check over to her. Now on the policy, my mum is named at 34% and my brother and I are named at 33% and my younger sister is not named. It turns out that the policy was not made before my sister was born, which adds to the murkiness and confusion surrounding why my sister is not included. My guess is that my dad signed up for this policy and forgot my sister's social, thinking he'd just come back to it later and revise. But he never got around to it, I guess. He was bipolar and did things impulsively sometimes. I think this life insurance policy was one of them. Well, at least he had life insurance. Suggesting we slow down and talk about this policy more has made me the bad guy in the family. My mum and my brother think that I am being selfish. It's gotten so tense that we have to discuss things via email because everyone is getting so emotional about it. My mum continues to insist that he made a mistake. 
She writes, When dad took out this policy, his intention was for me, my mum, to have money to pay off the house, which is already paid off, by the way, and have financial means to take care of the family. Dad would never, ever intentionally exclude his youngest daughter from this scenario if his intentions were to split things between the family. I believe he completed the paperwork incorrectly because he didn't understand how to write the policy to support his intentions. I responded with a proposal. The three of us split the cost of my dad's medical bills for the past two years of his illness, hospice care costs, and the funeral. After that is settled, my brother and I split our portions into three so that my sister gets a share. She does not like this proposal and passive aggressively told me to not bother paying her back for the medical and funeral costs. I also get the sense that she is trying to guilt trip me because she keeps saying that she can't afford to screen in her porch. I'm sure there'll be more updates. This feels long from over. Okay then, just as I was going to say with the first one, really, I feel like with this story, you need to just get a lawyer involved. You need someone in the mixer who knows exactly what is going on and exactly what you can and can't do to stop your mum from getting away with this. I am glad though that my fears after the first post before this update are not going to come to fruition. I was very worried there that you were just going to sign over just because she's your mum and be done with it. But thankfully, the people of Reddit have told you that that is not a good idea. And that is the beauty of Reddit and why I love the platform, because you do get the most genuine, helpful advice on the entirety of the internet from people who know a lot more than you. And look, I hold my hands up. I put myself in that situation too. A lot of times, if I need to know some information that I can't just instantly find, I'll ask a question on Reddit and I'll get fantastic answers. However, with all that being said, as I said at the beginning, I would still get a lawyer involved to make sure that you're not conned out of an incredible amount of money. Entitled parent parks in my driveway. I own a house a couple houses down from a school, so this was bound to happen eventually. When it's time for the kids to go home, my street is lined bumper to bumper with parents to pick up their kids. The sidewalks are full of families who walk all the way to their cars. I often have to pick up balloons, snack packaging, old homework worksheets, and general garbage that the kids drop. If you're trying to get home around the time school lets out, there is no way you're going to be able to get there before the blockade the parents make is gone. This has been a problem the few years we've lived here. There's two places the kids let out. My street, which is a small cul-de-sac with the school at the top, and a main road that's open all the way down to a baseball park with a wider road to allow street parking and two-way driving. Obviously, if you can't find parking, the tiny residential road isn't the way to go. There are three cars at my home. My car, my roommate's car, and my husband's utility van, which he parks on the road to avoid blocking our roommate since she's frequently in and out. Fridays, today, I work from home. So when I finish work, I put my head out the window to look at my fruit tree I have near my driveway. It's spring, I keep excitedly looking for blooms. And I notice a big white Buick SUV in the middle of my driveway blocking both spots for my car which my husband was using since I was home, and my roommate's spots. Honestly, why would you park in someone's driveway? So, on top of these entitled parents blocking up our small residential road, this person decided to take up a private residence's driveway. I got on the phone with the non-emergency police line and took pictures of the vehicle and plates. Then I got my husband's keys and backed his vehicle up to block the SUV into my driveway, and I waited. 50 minutes later, the mum, bug eye sunglasses, big old diamonds on her jewelry, and wearing athleisure, and she comes around to hop in the driver's seat and smiles and waves at me, sitting on my steps. Honestly, she probably thought I was the homeowner's kid or something, as I'm in my early 20s, atypical for a homeowner. Hi, hope you don't mind, she said. You're trespassing. Why would you park in a private driveway? Sorry, I w- won't do it again. We were just leaving. She was being really dismissive and avoiding eye contact, despite taking the sunglasses off. I don't care. You have no right to park on my property. I'm on the phone with the police. It was just for a second. I was just picking up my daughter. It doesn't matter. You don't live here. You don't park here. At this point, I realize the non-emergency police aren't going to pick up. So I hang up and decide to screw with her a bit. She got in her SUV and dismissively waved at me. So I got in my vehicle that was blocking her in and waited pretending to still be on the phone. She starts trying to back out of my driveway because there was a little bit of a gap between my utility van and my neighbor's car, but it was definitely too small for this Buick. I'd like to point out that this vehicle has a scuffed front bumper, so I had a feeling she has no spatial awareness outside of her backup camera. Every time she backed up, I honked, still pretending to be on the phone. 
She tried again. I honked again. She looked at my grass and I was about to start recording her in case she tried to go through my front yard and I honked again. If she kept trying to back out and hit my big utility van, she would certainly lose. She then gets out of her SUV and comes up to my van, recognizing that she can't do anything without making it far worse for herself. Her face was visibly patchy from the distress and she asked again, Are you really calling the police? Yes, you're illegally parked on my private property. That is illegal. I don't care if it's for five seconds. Don't freaking do it. You don't live here. Her kid then got out of the car and I decided that was enough. So I waited for her to get back in her SUV and I parked my van back in its rightful spot and I let her out. After that, I called the school and gave them the license plate number. Nothing would probably come of it, but I don't think she'll park in someone's driveway again anytime soon. I'll take the jerk points because there's a child involved, but you shouldn't put your child in situations like this anyways. I beat the heck out of my sister and sent her to the hospital. I can finally talk about this because all the legal proceedings have been dealt with. So I've been dating my boyfriend, Mark, for about five years. He is the best thing that has ever happened to me. He's kind, smart, understanding, and absolutely beautiful. When we started dating, he was a bit closed off and was afraid to initiate any form of intimacy. I at first thought it was because I was his first relationship and maybe he was nervous. But six months into us dating, he tells me that between the ages of five and 12, he was SA'd and awed by his mother. His father left when he was around four. It screwed him up in the head for a while. And when it got out, his mother was arrested and he and his two older sisters were put in the custody of their grandparents, who they lived with ever since. He was placed in intensive therapy and still goes to this day. He's come a long way and has healed a lot, but he still has some days where he gets really depressed and cries. Part of his therapy was exercising. So about two years ago, he and I started doing some bodybuilding workouts. I toned up a lot, put 20 extra pounds of muscle on, and he toned up a bit. Because we've been dating for so long and have marriage in mind, he told my family all about what had happened, though a less detailed version, and they welcomed him with love and support. Now for my sister, Sally. I've suspected that she's had a bit of a crush on him. She'll flirt sometimes here and there, but he never reciprocated and usually ignored her. I've talked to her about it so many times, but she didn't listen. To make a long story short, I'd gone out one Saturday afternoon with some friends to get some drinks and left Mark behind because he didn't feel like going. My sister had texted me prior to ask if she could borrow a few things from me, a sweatshirt, DSLR camera, and a third thing that doesn't come to mind at the moment. I said sure and to get it whenever. She went when I was out, unknowingly. When I came home, I found my boyfriend on the ground crying his eyes out and my sister trying to calm him down he was having a panic attack it's never safe to touch him when he has an episode because he may act out violently due to his headspace her hands were all over him and he was trying to push her away her shirt was also on the ground and she was only in her bra i tore her away and asked what the frick she was doing she said that she was trying on the sweatshirt when he walked in on her freaked out and went into an episode however mark through his tears said that she tried to touch him i asked my sister if it was true and she said no but mark again said she tried to touch him we have cameras in the house and i pointed them out to my sister her face went white and i don't know what came over me but i saw red i can't remember much because i was so angry but I beat the heck out of her. I can't even remember if I was the one who called 911 or it was her through her beat up state. I do remember kind of snapping out of it because Mark was still going through his episode and I could hear him crying louder and I had to help him through it. It's all a haze. So I broke my sister's nose and gave her a black eye and bruised her ribs. She was in the hospital for a few days. Well, there we go. A pretty insane story to start with. But Opie has given us an update and some more context around this post. First of all, this all happened right before COVID hit, the end of 2019, and everything was just settled this last month. Now, this was posted on the 4th of March, 2022. So that's how long it took. Secondly, the incident happened in our kitchen. The front door leads down a hall directly to our open kitchen and to the right is our living room that leads to the bedrooms. Third, we have cameras in every room but the bathrooms and bedrooms because we have a great Dane named Butler. He's black and has a white oval patch from his chest to his tummy. He looks like a butler who likes to get into everything. So we set up cameras to keep an eye on him while we're out. The cameras don't have sound recording. Four, 
My sister didn't R Mark, but she did try to coerce him into sexual activities. And five, my sister didn't know I was out when she came over. I don't have the recording anymore. It was too painful to keep, let alone watch. Also, my memory of the whole thing is hazy, but the tape showed Mark answering the door. Again, our cameras don't have sound recording, but Mark said that when he answered the door, she told him that she was there to get my camera and sweatshirt. He said, okay, and let her in. He was watching TV, so he went back to his show while she walked into our room. She called out to him for help, and the cameras showed Mark getting up to help her. I don't remember how long they were in there, but the tape showed Mark rush out of the room while holding his hands out as if trying to stop an attacker. My sister then emerged half naked while holding onto her shirt. Mark backed up into the kitchen, still holding his hand out, and she advanced towards him. Mark said he was telling her to put her shirt on and to leave, but she kept saying something along the lines of, Hey, it's okay. I just need some help. That's all. And you're a nice guy. Just help me out a little. I think by that point, he was declining into a panic attack as he started shaking. My sister took that opportunity to hug him. She said she did it to try and calm him down, but the tape showed her kind of grinding up on him. He pushed her away and fell to the ground crying and screaming. She then got down by him and was trying to wave her hands through his hair. Her other hand was also moving up towards his crotch. I remember from the tape seeing Mark flinch backwards and trying to push her away. She always moved back closer to him though. A few minutes later is when I got home and beat her to an inch of her life. I can't remember who called the police, but the police showed up and my sister limped to the door while I was trying to calm Mark down. I kind of remember them asking questions and trying to help Mark calm down as well. They thought he was going into shock, so they put a blanket over him and the paramedics came. My sister was quickly evaluated and then taken to hospital. Mark and I stayed behind because by that point, he started to regain control again. I remember my parents showing up and asking what happened and I told them everything. My mum stayed with Mark and I while my dad drove to the hospital to see my sister. Mark and I pressed charges on my sister, emotional trauma and sexual battery, class A1 felony where I'm from. My sister tried to sue me, a misdemeanor charge, but it fell through. With the evidence we had, my sister was sentenced to 60 days of incarceration with a bond of $5,000. No one paid. She also had to serve 200 hours of community service and her name was added to a sex offender registry she can appeal to the courts to have it removed after 10 years she was also placed under a restraining order on top of that my sister owes us twenty-five thousand dollars. i got a small slap on the wrist and i have to do 50 hours of community service nothing too bad my sister was cut off by some of the family and still is Mark regressed tremendously to the point that he couldn't sleep in the same bed as me for months. He was required to go into even more extensive therapy. He's come some way, but nowhere like he was before it happened. It's going to take a long time for him to heal. I consider myself bisexual, but I lean more towards men, while Mark is 100% gay. He finds the female body disturbing to the point that we've had to skip over full female nudity scenes in movies. My sister knew all of this. When I asked her why then she would do this, she said that she thought she could change his mind. I'm not proud of what I did, but I'm also not sorry. Oh man, there we go. I mean, what a story. You know what? I actually really, really like the revenge here. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. Two wrongs don't make a right. But I've read a lot of revenge stories where the revenge is perhaps meticulous or drawn out over a number of years. And while that is great, sometimes I do just sit and think to myself, if you've seen something happen, why not just sort it right there and then? And look, obviously you never want to be in this position, a truly horrible thing to go through, but I kind of like the fact that OP was just like, you know what, screw this. I am dealing with this right now. And yeah, it's my sister, but she's done a truly heinous thing and she deserves to be punished for it. What I absolutely love the most about the story, I mean, I'm saying love the most about the story. What I mean is what I love most about the, the resolution of this story, of course, is the fact that nobody paid the $5,000 bond. Not one member of your family paid that money. And a lot of the family now don't even talk to your sister. That just shows to me that everyone in the family knew, despite the fact that this is family, she's done a truly awful thing and she does not deserve to get out lightly. Look, the fact of the matter is her reasoning there at the end, saying that she thought she could change your boyfriend's mind, tells you absolutely everything you need to know about this woman. A truly, truly awful person and um, yeah, once again, I think you did the right thing. 
What I will say is, is on behalf of your boyfriend, what do you even begin to say really, if I'm being completely honest, but all I'll say is, I hope that, that he recovers well and eventually works through this with the help of you, your family, therapist, whatever. It seems like he's got a good support group and uh, oh, a truly traumatic thing. And I hope he gets through it. Now for our next story of nuclear revenge. This one, an absolute classic of the subreddit, posted four years ago and is one of the most upvoted, the most popular stories that has ever been posted. A friend set up my dad and he was nearly beaten to death. My grandfather got revenge on everyone involved. This isn't my story, but it comes from my dad and other family members who witnessed it. Background. This all went down in the late 1970s when my dad was 17. The area he grew up in was in the UK and was a stereotypical working class town. The part of town my family lived in was run down, full of poor families and had its fair share of crime, but it was close knit and everyone knew everyone. This will be important for later. Now, my dad wasn't the most well-behaved kid and he hated being at school. But aside from a speeding ticket, he'd never been in trouble with the police. He was, and still is, a really talented musician and had a very active social life. For his 17th birthday, one of his friends bought him a leather jacket with a very specific logo on it. We'll call this friend Dave for future reference. According to my dad, it was a rare and quite expensive motorcycle jacket. He was extremely happy that Dave had got it for him. Dave had bought himself the same jacket a while before, and it was a big surprise. My grandmother apparently joked that with the jackets on, they looked like twins, and she wasn't far wrong. They had similar features, black hair, and were both well known for being kitted out in motorcycle gear. A few days after my dad's birthday, he was leaving work as a bartender in the town center at around 10 p.m. As he was getting close to where his bike was parked, a gang of five men approached him from behind. The last thing my dad remembers was being smacked over the head and passing out as he hit the floor. These men beat up my dad with bike chains and a crowbar, literally to within an inch of his life. Luckily, two bouncers from a nearby pub heard the commotion and rushed to help. The men ran off and the bouncers called the cops and my dad was taken to hospital. It turned out that Dave had quite a substantial gambling habit and owed a large amount of money to people who you really didn't want to owe money to. They had threatened Dave and told him that they'd be looking for him to teach him a lesson. So Dave decided to set up my dad to take the beating instead of himself or at least lessen his chances of taking it. He'd bought my dad the same jacket because these guys knew that that was what he wore when he rode. He then arranged for a guy he knew to find out where my dad left work and call up the loan sharks to let them know where Dave was. What a scumbag. The revenge. My grandfather and grandmother were obviously distraught about this whole thing. The first thought on my grandfather's mind was if my dad would survive. When that was answered, his second was how best to get revenge. A bit of background on my grandfather. He was a lifelong boxer and a career military man. He enlisted at the back end of World War II at 17, stayed in the forces through Korea, and then served in Malaya and Burma as a scout and sniper during the mid to late 1950s. He only reluctantly retired when my dad was little and worked as an engineer after his discharge. This guy was a certified badass, even into his 50s. And although he wasn't the best husband or father at times, he could never stand by and watch his family get hurt. The first move my grandfather made was to call up every ex-service buddy, bouncer, pub landlord, etc. that he knew, and even a few less than legit characters he knew from the pubs. In my town, word traveled fast and my grandfather was well-liked and had a bit of a reputation, so it wasn't long before he had the names and addresses of the five men who'd attacked my dad. Apparently, these guys had been bragging about beating up a defenseless man from behind. These guys were career criminals with violent reputations, but my grandfather really didn't give a dang who or what they were. My grandfather then called up a few of the most dangerous, hardened guys he knew from the service. He explained to them what had happened, and they were all happy to help. One night, the group kicked in the doors of each thug and beat them to a pulp, all five of them. They knew that if they hit one, the others would hear about it and run, so they hit all five of them in one night. My grandfather knew no one would call the police in the area they lived in. Talking to the cops was a big no-no in that area back then, so there was little chance of being caught. All five guys ended up bloody with broken noses, shattered teeth, and the requirement to be fed from a tube by the end of the night. One of them had to be put into a medically induced coma. 
Of course, the police interviewed all of them in hospital when they sufficiently recovered, but none of them talked, both out of fear of my grandfather and fear they'd be labeled as rats and nothing came of it. But my grandfather wasn't done there. My grandfather used his connections in the clubs and bars to start spreading rumors about why they'd been beaten up. Soon it had gotten around that these five guys had screwed up and had beaten up the wrong person. Not only that, but they bragged about it and lied to whoever they worked for about it. Not only were they physically broken, but my grandfather ruined their credibility so that when they got out, no one, criminal or otherwise, wanted to be associated with them. Once this was all done, my grandfather turned his attention to Dave. He'd specifically left Dave for last, knowing that he would poop himself knowing that my grandfather knew what he'd done. My grandfather, however, was much more subtle in dealing with Dave, as he thought that a simple beating would be too good for him. He waited and asked around, and it turned out that Dave was not only a compulsive gambler, but also had recently turned into a heavy drug addict as well. My grandfather found out who he was buying his drugs from, when he would usually buy and where. He had a buddy of his follow Dave when he went to buy his stuff, follow him to where he was living, and let my grandfather know. My grandfather then called in an anonymous tip that there was a huge drug deal going on at the address and he thought he heard gunshots. He got two of his buddies to do the same. The police investigated, searched the house and caught Dave red-handed with boatloads of drugs in his home as well as counterfeit bills and a ton of other illegal stuff. Dave was charged, denied bail and ended up pleading guilty to all the charges laid against him. My dad could never remember his exact sentence but it was definitely heavy at least 15 years to add to that dave owed a lot of money to a lot of people and let's just say his time in prison was made much worse by this fact my dad never spoke to him again his parents disowned him his girlfriend dumped him he struggled to get a job with his record and when he got out he had to move miles away as no one he knew wanted anything to do with him my dad eventually recovered from his injuries although you can still see various scars on his body from the beating he took my grandfather never told anyone what he'd done until my dad asked him about it when he got really ill in the early 1990s. Dave's life was ruined and out of the five who attacked my dad, three ended up in prison later in life and two ended up dead due to crime. My grandfather passed away in the late 1990s and although my dad and him had their issues, it could never be said that he didn't look out for him when he needed it. Um... Wow, is all I can say after reading that. That was simply stunning. Uh, goodness me. Even what happened in the first instance, what Dave did to you was absolutely shocking. I, honestly, I know, well, this is about your dad, isn't it? I know your dad nearly got killed, but very clever from Dave to, to set your dad up as him. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but I was kind of thinking that's pretty genius from Big Dave to do that. Nonetheless, your grandfather's revenge, just like chef's kiss, because not only... Did he absolutely brutalize these five Donnies that deserve that? But he could have gone one further with Dave, but that would have been the wrong play. What he did in the end was absolutely perfect. You can't just let Dave get away with one beating. You can't. And I, I do think that the killing would have gone too far. So that lovely little middle ground of absolutely destroying his life is a perfect solution. So to your grandfather, I salute you. To Opie, your dad, I say, well, very tough that this happened, but hopefully you feel backed up by your dad and uh yeah overall a brilliant brilliant story with some very very satisfying revenge mess with my kids lose your house i am a 50 year old man and i've got two stepsons who i just call my sons as i've been in their life since they were eight and ten and they're now young men my wife and i made it a point to have a great relationship with their dad jason and made sure he had a chance to be around as much as possible even staying at our place frequently to be around his boys as he lived over an hour away and couldn't afford to live closer. Jason had a crazy ex-girlfriend who tried to claim they were married, variously saying common law or that they were married in secret or married on an Indian reservation, but he had a restraining order out against her because she was nuts and had tried various ways to screw up his life. The ex is a horrible person. She's been arrested several times for forgery and fraud. She and Jason had a fiery relationship, but he had it in his head that he should make it work as he did like her daughters and grandson. But the ex got him sent to prison for violating his probation when he left the county to go to his mum's funeral and hadn't filed an appropriate form. I am a little unclear on this part, but she played a major role in it. After he got out several months later, she wanted him back and he wasn't having it. 
He made a clean break moved to a new town, but she continued to harass him thus leading to the restraining order She would send text to people pretending to be police investigating Saying he was drunk driving or taking drugs or pretending to be friends and family to spread rumors and hurt him She even sent texts to my kids from burner phones pretending to be other family or friends saying awful things about their dad. Now, Jason died unexpectedly of a heart attack and it was a shock to all of us. He was finally living in peace, had great relationships with friends and his sons and was the happiest he'd ever been. He didn't have much. He lived in a single wide trailer. A friend had let him stay in for free. Some boxes of tools, old comics, video games, D&D books and modules, mementos from his time in the Marines, and an old 2009 pickup, which on several occasions he'd promised my oldest son. Let's call him Paul. Jason didn't have a will, and my wife became the executor of the estates, because at the time of death, both the sons were minors and sole heirs. We packed up the things out of Jason's trailer and took the truck which had Jason's name on the title, but had to wait for the death certificate to retitle it in Paul's name. But the ex called Jason's sister demanding the truck, saying it was hers and posting on Facebook that she was reporting it as stolen, etc., which really angered me. After we got the death certificates, we went to the DMV and found out that she had stolen the title to the truck by forgery, saying she was the only heir and we couldn't transfer the title. My son was driving around with a packet documenting everything in case he was pulled over for driving a stolen vehicle. My son was driving around with a packet documenting everything in case he was pulled over for driving a stolen vehicle. We had to get a lawyer and start a special process that took several months before our director at the DMV fixed it and we were able to title the truck with the ex continuing to threaten and cause problems, making everyone miserable and costing us several thousands in legal fees. Early last year, we got through probate courts The ex never showed, in spite of saying that she was the wife and sole heir. The court declared the boys as the sole heirs and my wife as executor of the estate in their names. Instead of showing up, the ex sent an email to the court saying she couldn't make it because of work, she doesn't have a job, and that Jason was never around his kids. He didn't miss a single high school football game, home or away, and never missed a home track meet, and that they were just leeching off his SSI for the back child support. She went on with a bunch of other non-relevant stuff just to trash my wife and sons and pretty much said it didn't matter what the judge said that she should get everything. During this time, we found out that Jason's name was on the deed of the ex's house. In order to get a reduction in property taxes because of Jason's disabled veteran status, she had filed papers to put him on the deed, but not the mortgage. If she'd just left my kids alone, we would have let it go, but she'd pushed principle beyond the point of detail so we filed suit for half the house. The property is worth about $380,000. We went to court ordered mediation and she rejected a mediated settlement of a fraction of the value which we would have taken. In April, her lawyer dropped her and so she got a continuance on the first hearing. She then claimed that she had found a will from Jason designating her as sole heir in addition to another signed paper that she found as a quick claim deed from Jason for the house. I did wonder if it was this or her not paying him which caused him to drop her She was going to go back to probate court to reopen I guess appeal the probate and needed time for that which the judge granted on tuesday We finally went to court on the deed to the house again She no showed the judge had inquiries to the probate court and she never filed any papers The trial lasted less than 10 minutes as the judge recorded the facts and awarded the estate half the property. They will impanel three lawyers to determine how the property will be sold and she's going to lose her house and for the first time in her miserable life, face the consequences of her actions. Frick around and find out. And there we go. That is the end of that one. I've got to say, first of all, OP, congratulations for winning the case. But I can't help but feel that it's very sad that Jason isn't around anymore or indeed wasn't around during the culmination of the story and now to see his kids grow up. You and your wife are doing an amazing thing. It's such a shame that that woman is just knocking about. I mean, why is she trying to fake a marriage that never happened? I mean, I know why, but come on. That's so easy to see through with just a little bit of questioning, right? Do you have the papers? No. Have you forged some things in the past? Yes. Hmm, maybe you're lying. Tough one. Uh, But yeah, overall, it's a shame that Jason isn't around. But yes, as I said, you 
and your wife are doing an amazing job for these kids. I will just say though, it might be worth getting some form of protection in place because I feel like now that she has literally nothing, and again, not your fault that she has nothing, you completely gave her the option, right? And as you said, if she hadn't messed with you, you wouldn't have messed with her house. I feel like there's a chance she may now come after you because at this point, what has she got to lose? So as long as you have some form of plan in place, if that is to happen or some protection order or some sort of legality, that would be good and make me feel better. And um, I'll be able to sleep at night until you do that. I'm going to be a little bit worried because, uh, yeah, I feel like she might be hot on your tails quite soon. But nonetheless, great revenge, very much deserved. Now moving on to our next revenge story of this episode. Now this one is an absolute classic posted over six years ago. One of my favorite posts of all time. Can't you just unload around me? So this happened earlier today and was too perfect to not share with you guys. I work in construction as the foreman for a new house build. The location is kind of strange. The house is 250 feet up a hill via a footpath only. All of our materials have to come up that footpath by hand. It's a pain in the butt to manually carry, quite literally, an entire house up this hill. One of our saving graces is having the two parking spots on the street at the bottom of this hill marked with official no parking signs. Unfortunately, there is an elementary school about half a block away, and the parents of children seem to regularly, at least twice a day, think it's okay to park in our spots. Now, I consider myself a reasonable person. So if someone is parked in the spots and we don't have a delivery or need to park a truck, I'll let it go. But if we need the spots and there's someone parked there, I will ask them to move nicely. And most of the time they do so immediately until today. I get a phone call from the lumber delivery truck that is en route to our location. He says he'll be there in about two or three minutes. I let him know that I'll meet him at the street and make sure he has space to park. He's carrying all of the material to frame the roof of our house, which is a lot of really big lumber and will take easily an hour to bring up the hill. So naturally, I didn't want him parked in the middle of the street with his hazards on for an hour when we have a perfectly good parking spot for him. As I begin my trip down the hill, I notice there is a school parent sitting in her car idling, assuming she's just waiting to pick up her child. I walk up to her car and politely let her know that she is parked in a no parking zone and we really needed to clear it to park a delivery truck. But she scoffs at me and rudely states back, I'll just be a few minutes and your truck isn't here. Take a chill pill, dude. Before I can respond, a giant lumber truck comes around the corner and I wave to him and then gesture towards him to the woman in the car who's now put her window back up to ignore me. I put on my best customer service smile and wave at her through the window. She puts it down halfway and angrily shouts, what? By now the truck has pulled up alongside her car and I politely ask her again with a stronger tone of voice to move her vehicle, reminding her that she's illegally parked in a tow away zone. Then she gives me this wonderful idea. She says, can't you guys just unload around me? Jesus, it's not that hard. I give her another smile and walk away. A brilliant plan forming in my head. I instruct the delivery driver to park as closely to her as possible and block her in with the porta potty that is at one end of our reserve spots and the parked car that is parked just adjacent to our spots on the other end. He smiles because he immediately gets what I'm trying to do and proceeds to expertly block this lady and her car into a little two parking spot jail. We unstrap the lumber and my guys begin humping material up the hill. Meanwhile, I call the police parking enforcement to let them know the situation. At this point in time, I wasn't trying to get her in trouble. I just wanted a record of why we were blocking part of the street so that we don't get in trouble with the city. The very friendly traffic officer lets me know that she can be there in about 30 minutes and deal with the situation for me. Wonderful. As we continue to unload lumber, the child of the parent shows up. And wouldn't you know it, mum is just now realizing that the lumber truck is parked so close that she can't get out of her driver door to meet her kid. She awkwardly clambers across the inside of her car and stumbles out the passenger door, shooting glaring looks at me and the truck driver in the process. She loads her kid into the back and then begins to realize that she has no way of leaving. She comes storming up to myself and the driver and states, I'm in a big hurry. You need to move your dang truck right now so I can go. Before I can respond, the driver gets a grin on his face and says, Mom, in order to unload the lumber on the truck, we had to unstrap it. And per our company policy, I'm not allowed to move the truck with any unsecured load on it. Sorry. This sends her into near aneurysm levels of blood pressure. 
Meanwhile, I can barely contain my laughter. Screw your policy. I have somewhere to be. She barks back at him. At this point, with impeccably convenient timing, the parking enforcement officer shows up and parks behind the truck. She doesn't see the officer arrive. And while the officer is still getting out of her vehicle, I just casually say, can't you just pull out around it? It's not that hard. With the biggest poop eating grin I've ever had, I watch as she realizes that I just used her line on her. Screw you, she yells and storms back to her car and angrily clambers back in through the passenger door and into the driver's seats. At this point, the officer is walking up to myself and the driver, but before she can even introduce herself, the mum in the car slams it into reverse and stomps on the gas, crashing into our porta potty and knocking it over. Then she throws the car into drive and tries to mount the curb and drive on the sidewalk. The officer, driver and I are staring in disbelief as she gets halfway over the curb and gets stuck. I can hear her screaming obscenities over the idling truck from inside her car. The officer promptly walks up to the door of the car and orders her out. My favorite part of the entire thing is watching her face go to shock as she realized she just did all of that in front of a police officer. She gets slapped in cuffs as the parking officer calls for a second unit and she's promptly sat on the very curb she tried to drive over. She sits on the curb yelling to the now two officers about how we told her she could stay there and that we never asked her to move. The traffic officer responds that she was the one who was originally called when she first refused to move and that she already knows what's going on. While myself and the driver are giving a report to the second officer, my guys finish moving the remainder of the lumber and the driver finishes his statement and takes off to go back to the yard. By the end of the ordeal, she was arrested, charged with child endangerment. Her kid was in the back of the car the whole time. Reckless driving, destruction of property, the porta potty, and driving on a suspended license. On top of all of that, she also got her car towed. The kid went home with his grandma and she went to spend some quality time in a cell. I never expected her to actually heed my advice to just pull out around it, but I think next time she'll probably think twice about parking in a tow away zone if she ever gets a license again. And there we go, guys. Hopefully you now see why this is one of my favorite stories that has ever been posted on Reddit. I mean, that's just brilliant. I just got the picture of her in my head. Her in her car, just completely sandwiched in. Just beautiful, beautiful stuff. And ultimately, if she just followed the rules and not parked somewhere that literally says no parking, none of this would have happened. Completely her fault. What you guys did was not illegal. I mean, she literally said, can't you just unload around me? You did just that. Fine with me. And uh, yeah, I mean, I do feel for her kid because, yeah, reversing into a port and then trying to smash through a curb and maybe through the van as well. I don't know, through the lorry. Pretty dangerous stuff. I was a bit surprised when I saw that charge, child endangerment. But then thinking about it, it makes complete sense. And uh, yeah, hope the kid's all right. What's amazing about this story is that in every single paragraph, there was a moment in which this Karen could easily have just been like, OK, you know what? I'm done. I've made mistakes here. I apologize. Not even apologize. Just say, fine, I was wrong. And just move or continue on with her day and not cause this terrible outcome. Every single moment, though, that she was offered that chance. And you offered her multiple, OP. She said, you know what? No, I'm doubling down. I'm going again. And she kept making the story and her situation and her kid's situation, sadly, worse and worse at every moment. That is the problem with these people. They have chances to get out of it. It starts off pretty chill. Please, can you just move out of the spot? It's no parking. Oh, yeah. Annoying for me because I would like to pick up my kid, but I'll do it. You have another chance. We're not going to go to the police. Just please move. Oh, we can load around you. Are you 100% sure? You see what I mean? At every moment, she could have just said, you know what? You're right. I'm gone. But she didn't. And that was her own downfall. Keep screwing over your group members. This teacher is tired of your trash. This is my first post here. And for reasons that will soon become obvious, this subreddit speaks to the depths of my soul. It's also a very long one because I want you to delight in my destruction. The particular flavor of this revenge comes from the fact that everything that goes down is the result of a domino effect that leaves devastation in its wake. My backstory. I've been teaching for many years, but it's important to understand that in my first year of teaching, I got put on blast by an elite group of entitled parents and their entitled kids. Not a week went by without someone either demanding my job, trying to undermine me, or just calling me a POS. I nearly quit halfway through the first semester. The verbal and emotional abuse 
was so bad. This was at a school in a tough area. So I was accused of racism constantly for asking kids to stop talking. I was ripped into for giving failing grades for missing work and even enforcing the rules in the student parent handbook got me in hot water. My principal reprimanded me for being a negative influence on the school and I was told that I needed to let more rules slide because he was tired of hearing from parents. I would have parents just show up unannounced to sit in on my lessons and then tell me I was a trashy educator, a bad human being, etc i have plenty of horror stories from that school alone but the point i want to make is that this experience defined the kind of teacher i became going forward to my next school i needed to be that person who was untouchable because i needed to focus on the one job that mattered teaching kids so my next school was in a fairly affluent area it wasn't uncommon for me to find out that my students parents made millions which brought its own unique set of problems However, my new principal was super supportive of me as long as I followed the school's handbook to the letter because by doing so, I was in line with the school's philosophy and protected by law. We seriously had parents filing frivolous lawsuits all the dang time. The school had long ago learned that caving to parents' demands spilled blood in the water and brought the rest of the sharks in droves. My first year at this new school was successful for many reasons, but primarily because the school culture was easily adapted to. By planning ahead, I was able to head off 99% of all negative parents at the pass. The few times a parent tried to rip into me at conferences, I ripped back so hard that I developed a reputation amongst the kids and parents as someone you couldn't screw with. Everything I did was in line with the rules and any attempt to take me down got stonewalled by my principal who would have to say, Mr. OP is following school policy, so I'm afraid the ultimate decision is his. No joke, I had some parents in tears because their kid could no longer get an A in my class. I wasn't the teacher who wanted to destroy kids, I just wanted them to be accountable, and sometimes that meant letting them fail. Needless to say, this job became a lot of fun, because instead of waiting to be ambushed by parents, I could work on making my class fun for my students, while still teaching them something. I made ironclad rules for the classroom that brooked little argument and would adapt the following year to make it harder for students or parents to ruin my day. I have many stories like this, but this is one of my favorites. So, the backstory. The year this happened, I taught a high school class with grades 9 to 12. That's 14 to 18 year olds for you overseas guests. My class wasn't necessary to graduate, but did count as a core requirement. One of my beginning of the year rules was, I never want to hear... When will we ever need this because you didn't have to sign up for this class? How I structure my class is that I try to make students accountable for their own actions. My class was built so that I had something to offer everybody. If you tried your best, you were guaranteed a C. If you worked really hard, you could get a B or an A. I would bust my butt to help a student with any reasonable request. The best example of this was a student working hard on an assignment who said, I think I understand it now, but I can't turn it in on time. To which I answered, then turn it in tomorrow for full credits. This is how hard work pays off. Other than a few hard deadlines in my class, I would do whatever it took to see you learn the material. Now, screw around in my class? Well, I've already found ways to run circles around the pathetic excuses you throw at your parents for your awful performance. It sounds callous, but I was the teacher who would stay for 90 minutes after school to help you catch up to help fix your project for another class, or even to listen to you cry about your parents' divorce. If I caught you goofing in class instead of doing your work, my rule was that at least 70% of class time was intended for homework, quizzes, etc. I would warn you a couple of times, email your parents, and then wait and see if they even gave a dang. If they didn't, I would let you keep digging that hole until you were hip deep in water and begging for a ladder. And then I would toss you a rope instead. You could still climb it if you tried hard enough, but a lot of kids would just cry until that hole caved in and buried them. I also utilized my school's online grading slash assignment system for nearly all of my assignments, which meant I could document when a student looked at the assignment, how long it took them, etc. All of this allowed me to see what my students were doing, when they did it, and also if they were plagiarizing. This was one of the tools that helped me make important decisions about leniency and also allowed me to say things at conferences such as, of course the test was hard, your child didn't attempt the nine homework assignments until 11 p.m. the night before the test. Being able to prove that a student wasn't trying made it impossible for blame to be laid unfairly at my feet. It also meant the worst kids avoided my class. Bonus. However, this year something magical happened. 
Every other year, I would get a wave of kids who just wanted to screw around and blame everyone else for doing poorly. At the end of the year, students would talk terribly about me, my class sizes would drop the following year, then I'd receive high praise from those kids, so everyone would sign up, so on and so on. But this year, not only did I get a giant wave of knuckleheads, but they came with parents who loved to make trouble. I'd already heard tales of some of these parents. Other teachers were just dying to hear stories about our interactions because these parents were very much entitled. They would name drop lawyers when they didn't get their way, try to badger teachers into giving their kids extra credit, and would largely deny any wrongdoing on their kids' part. These were the parents who would get called in because their student was busted cheating, then accused the teacher of making the class too hard, therefore validating their students' need to cheat. So about these knuckleheads, it was a group of roughly seven senior boys who all shifted their schedules to be in the same period with each other. The other teachers could not believe that I had all of them at the same time, but I just shrugged it off. Every week, the staff lounge was dying to know how I dealt with their shenanigans, but for the most part, I'd shut down most of their trash from day one. I actually got along very well with them, despite their constant goofing, because they'd mastered the ability to appear busy and didn't distract my other kids. Then came the first group project. My class size was just right for seven groups of four to form. The idiot collective formed two groups of four by pulling in a kid who'd been absent on the first day of the project. These two groups crashed and burned on this project super hard for several reasons. But the biggest were that A, they screwed around during class time, and B, put off a two-week assignment until the weekend before, and then dumped all the work on everybody else, which resulted in everybody doing minimal efforts. I handed out their terrible grades and was immediately pulled into parent conferences with several of them, one at a time, obviously. Every meeting was the same. My kid did all the work, so he doesn't deserve a bad grade. Or... My kid didn't understand the assignments, to which I handed over my hyper-specific rubric, which is a checklist for how I grade things. I never wanted to be accused of grading based on not liking a kid. These largely went like this. My kid did all the work, and I don't think it's fair it should hurt his grade, an entitled parent would say. Well, here is the work your student turned in. I'd then hand it over. Here is my rubric, which I printed and emailed to your student the day the project started. Then I'd hand that over. As you can see, I have itemized the grading for ease of use. I'd be happy to go over the grade your student earned. The entitled parent would then read through all the evidence and look at their kid. Where are the missing parts? Uh, my group members were responsible for that. Then I would say, I can't grade what I never received, so I can't reasonably just raise your kid's grade. Sorry. Now, good news for all my students. I make assignments worth more throughout the semester with the idea that kids who screw up early on can make it up later by working hard. I seed extra credit throughout the semester and all of these parents are disgruntled but happy to hear that their entitled embryo can still get an A in my class. Now, the end result of these meetings was that it clearly wasn't my fault. Remember, I had all this data to prove that I made every effort to contact everybody, etc. So it must be the other kids' fault. So these parents would all decide that their perfect angel is no longer allowed to work with their previous group mates. Like a cancer, this failure of friends distributes through the rest of the class. Like the genius that I am, I make my students write a group contract for every project that details who does what and when it is due. Now, why is this important? Because the contract provides me the documentation necessary to allow me to dismiss a bad group member and give them a zero without their parent trashing all over my day. So here is where the problem begins manifesting. These seniors begin bouncing from group to group like cancerous ping pong balls wreaking havoc. I let students choose their groups. So these seniors are desperately integrating with anybody that will have them. Because of my class size, every group has at least one coddled child to deal with. And these children just end up rotating until all of my students have worked with one of these seniors at some points. Now I'm getting constant complaints from parents of other kids about these boys. Their kid wanted a good grade, which means they ended up doing all the work while the senior slacked. This is usually after the fact, at which time I bring up, I would love to yank that leech out of your grade pool, but you have to use the contracts. Students don't want to say anything because they fear retribution from the seniors, but I can't do anything because I'll be accused of harassment. The contract can provide me with the leverage I need to prove that these kids were doing no work because these seniors have been playing their parents for years. 
I make my class utilize Google Docs because the changes are timestamps. No joke, I've had students produce all the work the morning of a parent meeting to try and lie their way out and make me look like a POS, but that timestamp is a godsend. Luckily, my class is balanced. A trashy group mate can make things hard, but not undoable. And parents are appeased that I have an out for their kid but disappointed that their kid doesn't use it. Every time I announce a group project is on the way, some of these seniors sucker up to the other kids to the point that it is expected that a spot will be made for them. I'm talking buying kids lunch, bringing them gifts, etc. Seriously, the day before a group project starts, all of the seniors now sit at separate tables from each other so that they could pull the I'm already here, let's be in a group card which works most of the time. The strain on class morale is difficult, but I'm biding my time. The other students are grabbing at extra credit opportunities constantly so that their grade can absorb the blow. And parents' complaints are completely mitigated because I'm still offering every chance for success. My principal has a copy of my syllabus in his computer so that he can quote student policies that the parents signed off on. Not uncommon for him to hear, I don't read that so it doesn't apply. But he then reminds them that the clause above the signature line says, my signature denotes that I've read this document in its entirety and agreed to abide by all the rules or something similar. And that this should be a lesson to the parent and the student that when you sign something, you should read the fine print. Notes, if you ever become a teacher, find an awesome boss like this and stick by their side. So the setup. In total, I have seven slothful seniors, but I shall name the worst of these Larry, Curly and Mo. The fallout affects all of them, but these three are the ones whose parents have a hard-on for making trouble. Every time they bully a teacher into compliance, I imagine they sit around a smoking room with cigars and cognac, laughing at how they got their way yet again with a lowly teacher. I know that anything I do will be heavily scrutinized once the grades start falling, and I need to be able to shrug it off because I've got other stuff to do and I refuse to be the smiling topic of discussion in their celebratory circle jerk. However, a special note about Larry. Since he turned 18, his parents now travel non-stop and are impossible to reach. Larry is now just a huge douche because his parents no longer care about what he does. I closely monitor their grades in my class, but also in others. Now this may sound sketchy, but I routinely do this with any of my students who struggle with the material so that I can identify if the issue is my class or all of their classes. Students have been known to fake their grades using inspect elements and I got tired of hearing, but they have A's in their other classes because then I look like a POS. Anyway, after a check, I speak with the other teachers. It isn't hard to find out that these boys are doing minimal work in other classes. And I actually discover that Larry has been finding ways to get other kids to do the work for him and then disseminating it among his friends. Other teachers have been bullied into lowering test percentages in their class. And guess what? He and his friends are enrolled in his classes. Despite bombing these tests, homework and project grades give them a comfortable cushion so that most of them are floating at low Bs. I can't prove this, they're using Snapchat. But when I bring it up with their teachers, the teachers don't feel like trying to prove it and duke it out with the parents. Now, they are gaming other classes for minimal effort. However, their only recourse in my class is to keep rotating through groups and leeching off of their hard work to maintain Cs and Bs and the other kids are too nervous to utilize the group contract to get them fired. Remember how I mentioned that I steadily increase the value of my assignments to keep kids working and give them a chance to fix their grades? So here is me on a random day in class. Hey everybody, I was looking in the schedule and realized that your last project before finals may stress you out unnecessarily. Would anybody mind if I dropped it? My class, who are tired of getting banged on group assignments, say, Nope, drop it. Best teacher ever. Okay then. Well, just so you know, I reply, I'm going to move our next project back a couple of weeks and extend the deadline by a week. Also, since I cancelled the last project, this means that the next project will now be worth roughly 20% of your final grade. So do your best. Screwing this up could kill your grade. My class, whatever.jpg. So in one step, I have inflated this assignment and also moved it. I send out an email to parents and students, letting them know about the change to the syllabus and the assignments. I get no responses other than happiness that I'm removing stress from the end of the semester, etc. I actually did this primarily because another teacher, who was also a huge douchebag, plunked down a monster project that same week and I knew it would burn out my students prior to finals. So I figured a break was in order. Win-win for me, really. Now, why did I move it? Maniacal laughter.mp4. 
The Friday before the project started, I announced at the start of class. Okay, I'm introducing the project now so that you can get into groups today and we can do it first thing Monday morning. Without delay, since this project is so important. This announcement elicits a room full of poop eating grins. Why? It was senior ditch day. Now, our school didn't condone a ditch day, so the kids tried their best to keep it a secret, but I found out a month in advance. All seven of these kids, therefore, were absent from class, which meant that I had just given the entire room freedom from these dead weights. Immediately, groups are formed, and even better, I had a couple of kids transfer out my class at semester, which meant, numbers wise, these knuckleheads will have to work on this last group project together in two groups. I emphasized that everyone needed to get to class as soon as possible so that they could start as soon as attendance was called. My original intention was to light a giant fire under all seven of these chumps to get them to actually put in the effort they'd neglected to do all year. Most of them are grades in the low C range, except for one in the low Bs. As a bonus to all my students, I put an extra credit portion on this project so that they could recoup their early semester losses, but also allow these seniors to do very well if they put in the efforts. This wasn't meant to be a revenge tale, but an attempt to give them one last lesson in responsibility. Before the end of the day, I send out a parent-student notification that the project had been started and that any absent students needed to contact their classmates to establish groups before Monday morning. This was important, as you'll see. I'm sure you can guess what happened next. So then, getting right back into the story immediate fallouts the next monday the seniors come traipsing in seconds before the bell to discover that there are only two tables to sit at whatever they take their seats i say after attendance okay everybody has a copy of the rubric so go ahead and get started the rest of the class immediately pulls out the rubric the seniors though look around frantically the seniors quickly realize that they've been played and the arguing starts First thing that happens is that Larry, Curly, and Mo decide that they now belong with whoever they happen to be sitting with and scoot their chairs over to sit with different tables. I catch this right away and tell them that the groups are already at maximum size, four people per group. The other four seniors are already fighting with each other because they know that none of them will actually do any work. Larry, who thinks he's God's gift to everybody, tries to sweet talk me and his group into special privileges and allowing a group of five. Now, I see some of the other kids wavering, and I know that Larry is putting pressure on them to argue his case. But I designed this project for specifically four people, and I had a job for each one. However, I extended a separate offer. I will let you join, but since there will be five of you, I expect double the work. Literally, I told them they would have to do the project twice. Larry tries to argue, but I point out the roles I have established and inform him that if four people could do it once, Having five should make it easier to do it twice. Sounds like a bad move on my part, but I've now intimidated the other kids into saying, heck no, and even have them put it to a vote. Unsurprisingly, Larry is the only one who votes that this is a good idea, and when the other kids catch wind of my offer, they physically shoo off the other seniors trying to pull this deal as well. You will all be delighted to hear that the rest of the period for my seniors is spent arguing over who will work with who. They end up forming three groups and I nod my head, make sure they have the rubric and then wish them the best of luck. Being the smart teacher that I am, I email Curly's parents and Mo's mummy that they have chosen to work with each other. Mo's mummy shows up to argue with me all the time, but has quickly learned I won't take her trash. At a previous meeting, she even laid into Mo and told him, I'm tired of fighting all these battles with your teachers and I'm starting to think that you're the problem but I suspect that that was for show. Curly's parents email me back and say they will make sure Curly writes a group contract. You see, Curly has sold himself as the best student ever, and clearly he will do the work and fire his classmates. Mo's mummy immediately requests a meeting with me. Per school policy, I do not have to respond to an email for 48 hours. I wait until hour 47 and email a non-committal, I would love to meet, when are you available? And wait for a response. I then wait for another 48 hours to inform her of a time the following week that works for me. Now, some of the other senior parents have emailed me angrily demanding why I let their kids choose to work with the bad kids again. I had to inform them I didn't expect all of them to be absent. Immediately, some of my seniors get burned at home because they ditched. Just try to help them pass, which I agree to. 
Some of them need this class for graduation, after all. Mo's mummy, on the other hand, shows up ready to wage war. She starts by demanding that I put Mo in a different group. I decline, because the project has now been going on for a week, and that wouldn't be fair. She demands that I add him to another group, though. They're all full, though, and students have already done the lion's share of the work. She then demands that I let him work by himself with an extension. I gladly offer him an extension and slide a copy of the rubric over to him, and he goes white. At this point, he knows that he's never planning to do any of the work. In fact, I know that his group hasn't even started. I've got a copy of their group contract, which was hastily scribbled in pencil with no due dates on it. He starts arguing with his mum that he'd rather work with his friends and that he's upset that he got stuck in this situation. Contemplating this, she accuses me of deliberately waiting until that day to screw the seniors over. After all, it was a school sanctioned event and I'm being a douche about it and she'll go to the board with her story. Wrong. The joy I get from all of my prep work is shutting down BS like this. All seven of the seniors hung out on ditch day at her house and told her that the principal had given them the day off. Even better, they called in and pretended to be their own parents so that it was an excused absence. He is immediately busted and his mum flips her switch and jumps all over him. You see, she can keep pressing me on this issue, but I now have evidence that he pretended to be his own dad and that is a suspendable offense. I buy myself into her graces by telling her that I had no idea that senior ditch day was that Friday, but I gave her kid a free extension on the homework that was due because I thought seniors deserved their own traditions, blah, blah, blah. She buys it. Also, I can prove that I emailed him and her and gave them plenty of notice before Monday morning that they needed to pick groups before something like this happened. Obviously, once I found out about ditch day, I tried to give her precious treasure a heads up, but I don't know why he didn't take it. She makes him open his email. My email is sitting there unopened and I have won this battle. She thanks me and takes him home. Class morale is super high unless you're one of the seniors. A week before the project is due, neither group has actually started, then the HMS class average is about to hit an iceberg. The project comes due. It comes as no surprise that my enterprising seniors have turned in easily some of the worst work ever. One group got into a text argument the weekend before it was due and made one of the kids do all the work. Mo and Curly are in this group. The other group, with Larry, has also turned in a steaming pile. I make sure to grade these two projects first because I know the fallout is going to be big. All the seniors dropped at least one letter grade. A couple dropped two. This is four weeks before graduation. Larry appears to take his F- in stride. They got something like a 10% on it, so I know he's plotting something. Curly's parents demand a meeting and so does Moe's mummy. Curly's parents are super upset that they got a bad grade and demanded to know why. What they didn't know was that I'd already met with the student who did the entire project, poorly, and his parents. I informed Curly's parents that I'd seen the text exchange between the seniors that pretty much ended up with, you freaking do it. Curly refused to turn over his phone to his parents for confirmation. I also show them Curly's project and hand over the rubric. Mum and dad are not happy. You see, Curly has been blaming everyone else for his mistakes since the dawn of time, and his parents have bought it completely until today dad pointedly asks which part did you do and this causes curly to spout actual tears i then pull up a spreadsheet of all of the group project scores from the year with no student data and have highlighted his scores which are among the worst the purpose of this was to use data to prove that their son frankly never does the work curly is absolutely destroyed by this his parents kick him out of the conference because they're tired of his excuses and ask me what they can do I tell them I'd be happy to offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring and that he can still pass the class if he does his homework and gets a B on the next exam. They agree to this, we all shake hands, and they leave. Curly's story largely ends here. He never shows up to tutoring, and I email his parents. After three emails, his dad finally responds with, His mum and I have decided that he needs to learn to be an adult and are leaving him to his own devices. Thank you for your efforts. Curly will spend the rest of the semester doing little to no work. Because he's grounded at home, he's now just watching YouTube videos on his phone during school. The ripple effect is glorious, because now Curly is doing this in all of his classes. 
I speak with his teachers and they all email that he's quit doing work in class and get the same reply I did rather than the vehement responses they're used to. When Curly fails his classes, he still graduates, but his parents have informed him that they are no longer paying for his college and it's time to get a job. Mo's mummy flips her lid and demands answers. Unfortunately, Mo is in the same group as Curly and she gets the same answers from me. Strangely enough, once she's exhausted every effort and attempt to somehow blame me for this, she admits that she knew Mo was part of bullying the lone senior and that he should be ashamed of himself. She deliberately tried to play me, but outed herself once she knew that I already knew everything. Super annoying, but I do agree to help tutor him one-on-one, -on -one, which makes her happy. Long-term fallout. Mo's mummy is emailing me every few days now. Is my son doing his work? Did he get help with his homework, etc.? non-stop but she knows better than to fight with me larry is unusually chipper and is no longer doing his work i found out that larry is supposedly going to a college where he just needs to maintain his gpa over a super low number he claims an f in my class won't change anything so i make sure he doesn't distract the others mo shows up only occasionally but strangely enough larry pops in just to say hi whenever mo is getting help I can't fathom why he does this, but suspect he's up to something and already have a backup plan in place. You see, Mo's mummy is nuts and I make sure that there's always another person in the room with me when I tutor him. Anyway, Mo's mummy is constantly checking in. I start waiting 48 hours between emails, cause I can, and she starts dropping by in person unannounced to check in on him, but really me. She's been acting cagey lately and I'm starting to suspect something. It's freaking Larry. Larry is a friend of Mo's. So he's been in her home feeding her made up stories to convince her that I've been emotionally abusing Mo when other students aren't around. Stuff like I was calling him the R word after school, etc. And then telling her, you could even have the school check the cameras to see that I'm there. This starts a whole thing where Mo's mum is now demanding answers from admin. But Mr. OP is smart. The admin asked me about details regarding my interactions with Mo, and I end up sitting down with my principal, Mo, and Mo's mummy. She details that Mo is struggling, might not graduate, and that she believes that I've singled her kid out for abuse and wants his grade raised. You see, Mo is dumb and lazy, and his mum is just as bad. When Larry went to her with his story, she never bothered talking about it with her own son. He just agreed and went along with it. So I asked Mo point blank to please describe what has been said during our sessions and then offer to leave the room so that he can tell the principal without me there. She tells me to stay because she wants me to hear from her son what I've done to him. What neither of them knew was that I was a mentor teacher. That meant I had a first year teacher as my mentee. Not a student teacher, but a new hire that works with a veteran teacher to learn the ropes of our school. And I had her working on grades and such in my room after school. You need so many contact hours on the days I agreed to meet Mo. She was young, so Mo thought she was another student and never questioned it and couldn't even remember that she was in there. My principal already had statements from her detailing my interactions with Mo and Mo was unable to give any actual details and suddenly forgot what had been said to him. This lands her in hot water with admin and Mo's mummy blames the whole thing on Larry and becomes visibly upset that she fell for such a stupid ruse. This results in an email cautioning teachers from being alone in a room with either student. Suddenly, after school help evaporates for both, but hey, I always have someone in my room, so whatever. After that meeting, Larry is now suddenly super concerned about his grade. I rationalized that he was hoping to burn me out of my job and then use the fallout to get a free passing grade. Obviously it doesn't work, so screw Larry. I have kids who actually want to succeed. My free days are now on days I know he works and he never shows up for tutoring anyway. Now that other teachers are hesitant to meet with him, he's unable to cut deals to raise those grades either. Seriously, teachers fell for his change of heart spiel every semester. Most mum makes a last ditch effort and tries to convince me that the parents of the seniors have scheduled a meeting with my boss to have me fired for giving their kids a bad grade and that she would be willing to put in a good word for me if I meet with her first. I'm sitting next to the principal when I get this email through an app on my cell phone, and he has no idea what she's talking about. I tell her that I'd be happy to meet everybody, but that I would probably eat my lunch during such a meeting, and that I hoped people didn't mind the smell of fish. I get a, no, seriously, they're threatening to sue you. 
but I feigned stupidity and informed her that surely I couldn't be sued for eating fish during a meeting? She now realizes I give zero Fs about anything and can't be threatened. Again, there's nothing she can do because I'm simply following policy. The last few weeks are frantic for these seniors. One by one, they fall because they've done little to no work for a couple of years now and they have no idea how to apply themselves. Other teachers are emboldened by how hard I shut them down and finally hold them accountable. A few of them just barely manage D's in my class. The rest fail. I get a few last second squeaks of, what can I do to raise my grade? But have now documented that none of them attempted the extra credit assignments and that that was their chance. It's hard for a parent to trash on you when you can prove you actually try to give their student extra credit and can then prove they never opened the assignment online. These guys are now failing some of their other classes. A couple have breakdowns in my class and leave crying. Their friendships are fracturing with each other because they now all hate each other for what happened, which they'll get over during the summer. My last test came and I made it an online multiple choice test. It was easy enough to have the questions and answers shuffled in random order, meaning they couldn't cheat off each other. You see, I knew for a long time they'd sit next to each other to try and cheat on the exam, and Larry had blown a ton of money on a tutor to try and carry his friends. This though throws them all off. And when Mo's mummy accuses me again of trying to trick her kid with a much harder test, it was easy enough to shoo her away with a simple email. Larry passes the exam, but his grade moves up to a meager D minus. Finally, the results. Of these seven seniors, one didn't graduate and had to transfer schools. His parents were embarrassed that they paid to fly the whole family out for a graduation that he didn't get to take part in. Two of the seniors lost all of their scholarships and could no longer attend the schools they wanted. Their fallback plan was to attend the same school together and become roommates, which they did with three of the other seniors, including Mo. I do have some other stories because I still work at this school and occasionally hear from the kids who graduated. Larry's college was not happy with his final GPA. I'm not sure what his long game was, but it sucked. The college kicked him out before he could even start, and I found out his huge web of lies extended to his parents too. He toured Europe over the summer and tried to surprise his parents by coming home instead of going to school. Apparently, they kicked him out immediately after because they were selling their house to get a condo somewhere else. Remember, they travel for work all the time now, so wanted to downgrade. Last I heard, he made up a story that he joined the military but got released due to a made-up illness. I say made up because I heard this story from three different people and each one was given a different disease. Curly's parents relented and decided to pay for Curly to go to college after all. Curly got kicked out halfway through the year though, got busted more than once for underage consumption, and they then kicked into the curb after living at home for a year and refusing to get a job. Last I heard, he works in a vape shop. Mo went to school and used his book smarts to try and pay other kids to do his work for him. His mummy is rich. When that failed, he faked his craze to get his mum to keep footing the bill. Eventually, the school kicked him out and he moved back home. The story his mummy told a friend of hers, who I ran into at a school function, was that he decided he'd rather be an entrepreneur than go to college and that he bought a drone to film weddings with. Last I heard, he was acting as a distributor for his weed dealer, but had moved up to selling acid on the side. His mummy thinks he works weddings. One senior went to college with his friends and immediately realized he needed to change. He quit hanging out with his friends and, last I heard, graduated with honors in a lucrative field. He emailed me once to thank me for challenging him in high school because it prepared him for college. So that was nice. So that's it, that's the end. Thanks for reading. And if you ever had a teacher you loved, send them an email. We love hearing from our children. Wow, and there we go. That is the end. What a story. Again, immediately, I just want to say to OP, the way you deal with these people is just phenomenal. I I don't know how you do it. You just do it with such calmness. And you just know exactly what you're doing at all moments. I guess this just proves that if you really are careful in your your day-to-day workings and you back yourself up, and you make sure that you always have evidence and you're just a good person that that does things to the letter of the law, then you can always cover yourself no matter what happens. I will say the way you handle the parents in particular, Mo's mummy, is just actually brilliant because I can I can 100% think of a lot of my teachers in the past that have definitely backed down to entitled parents like that. But the way you just say, nope, 
you're wrong because of this, 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 and this. And by the way, I have all the evidence right here. It's phenomenal. What I love about this story the most is that you've done all of this, not because you want to make a point or because you really don't like these, these students. You wish they worked harder and you want them to fail because they're disrupting the rest of your class. No, that isn't the point. That's very clear to see. You're giving them, if anything, not just education, but life lessons. I mean, that is epitomized by the email you received by one of those seniors. What if you had gone easy on them and just said, oh, you know what, you're not doing any of the work, but fine, you can pass, get into college. That's not gonna help them in the long run, is it? They're gonna get to college and just absolutely fail and then be in a worse spot because you know, they're even further on in their life and education. And yeah, the failings in college are obviously more serious than they would have been previously. So the fact that you did all of this at that stage in their lives, as one of the seniors has said to you, is a great thing. And ultimately, I think in the end, they all will probably look back and think, yeah, that teacher, OP, was pretty good and we messed about. My dad, who is trans, has discovered how to beat transphobes in the South. We're currently in the South visiting family. When we were at a restaurant, my dad, who is female to male, had to go to the bathroom. I'm still not entirely sure how, but a guy in there determined that he was trans and went shouting to the barman to kick my dad out. My dad, instead of trying to win that argument in a bar full of southerners, decided to go the complete other direction. He channeled his inner southern righteous fury and went off on that man for accusing him of being a transgender, demanded that he be kicked out, and called the guy an agent of satan long story short it worked got the other guy and his family kicked out and got a free beer for his troubles i thought this sub would appreciate that well there we go that is absolutely genius now of course not the ideal way of going about it i mean ideally you'd be in a spot where you can just say to the barman or landlord or people in there by the way someone is being transphobic to me can we get them out but yeah as you say in southern america maybe that's not possible and um, if you want to get someone kicked out and you don't really mind about the ethics of how you do it then sure this was great. I mean, it worked a treat. Fair play. I mean, it's literally one of the biggest Uno reverse cards I've ever seen. No, how dare you call me trans. The fact that you've even done that is punishable by getting out of the bar. Great stuff. Refuse my mother entry to your horse track. Don't expect access to our personal road. My granddad used to own a piece of land next to a horse racetrack. Their land almost surrounded my granddad's, except for him having access to a heavily trafficated public road. The racetrack was laid out in such a way that their exercise track was placed north of my granddad's land, while the main track with the stadium was placed to the south. Way back when the racetrack was built, they'd asked my granddad if they could transport their horses across his land. There was already a maintenance road in place, and as they only moved their horses, he didn't really mind, as they also supported the local village. As a small thank you for this, they allowed him and his guest to watch the races for free. Normally, it would cost around five US dollars in our local currency. Not that much, but it allowed him to take me and all my cousins to watch the horses for free. Anyhow, fast forward a couple of years and my granddad passed away. My mother, who inherited the land, tried to bring her grandchild, my niece, to the racetrack to see the horses, just as my granddad used to. At the counter, she is told that she has to pay for admission. Not really that big of a deal, as she thought that they didn't know that she now owned the land. Afterwards, however, when she writes to the track to rectify the situation, they tell her that she won't be admission free as it was a one-time deal they'd struck with my granddad that now was off. So enter the petty revenge. A few months later, when we had planned to cut down some of the trees for lumber, my mother told the contractors to accidentally leave one or two logs across the maintenance road. The racetrack, now having to load their horses on trolleys as they had to use the busy public road instead of our maintenance one, almost immediately sent an email to my mother, apologizing, offering her that same deal as my granddad received if we'd removed the logs. She only informed them that the one-time deal they'd struck with my granddad was off. In the end, after some wrangling, we ended up with a deal where they now have to pay my mother around 400 US dollars every month in addition to her and her guests having free admission. And there we go, some solid revenge right there. If anything, as soon as I started reading the story, I was thinking, yeah, you know, tickets are nice, but they're worth $5. You are giving access to a really important road for this company's entire, you know, business model, right? Without that road, as we've seen, the whole thing kind of gets decimated. So from the off, you should have been getting money. However, the fact of the matter now is that they they took you for granted and you're now doing pretty well out of it. $400 doesn't actually seem like enough. I'd say even push for some more. You have the monopoly on that road, obviously. Go for more. Go for a K. 
see what they do. The good thing is, you're back to enjoying the horses. Call by law on me because I'm too sick to mow my grass. Enjoy your view of my eight foot fence. So the call about the long grass was kind of a last straw thing. The backstory is, my grandpa passed away two years ago and I moved into his house. He was pretty healthy, but he let the yard go down a bit. The grass was maintained, but the trees were overgrown, his pond and patio were dirty, etc. Our neighbor, years ago, sold their yard to a property builder. Our properties are in an L shape, so our neighbor was using our backyard as her virtual backyard. For the past two years, I've been trying my best to maintain the backyard, while also working and dealing with my grandpa's stuff. Well, for the past few weeks, the backyard has fallen a bit, as stress from work has creeped in and I was sick for a few weeks. Before this, the neighbor has always had nitpicks, but I mostly ignored them. But this time they rang the door to complain about mess in the back and i told them i have a life outside this house if it bugs you that much you're more than welcome to do the work following that bylaw came by and they were very understanding about my situation and gave me more than enough time to feel better and mow the lawn well that whole thing angered me and i wanted to get the typical white picket fence as there wasn't a fence and we were passively looking for a dog so i decided screw it and i built the largest fence i could and since her house was right on the property line she now looks out the window and instead of seeing my backyard just sees a wooden fence and there we go the definition of a noisy neighbor why not just be happy with what you have right now first of all you don't have a garden yourself but you have access to one in the form of your neighbors at least looking at it you can't really say to them oh yeah by the way uh, ever since i sold my garden can you make sure that you keep yours really pristine so i can look at it i'm not going to help at all and it's actually nothing to do with me but yeah if you don't mind keep it really looking great uh it's just not gonna go down that well surely know your place and know the fact that you don't even have a garden and you're lucky enough to see one in the first place but uh yeah great karma great revenge if you tell someone to do something and it's not your business then um yeah someone's well within their right to say you know what no i'm gonna make it worse and that is exactly what op did very well indeed move my furniture my turn this happened when i'd only just moved from home and got my own place Super proud of myself as I'd saved like a demon and bought, with mortgage obviously, my first place. Lovely little two-bed flat in a slightly rough area, but I loved it and it was all mine. My mum and stepdad came to visit for a few days a few months after I was settled in. Nicely decorated in my own style, all my own furniture. One of the evenings they stayed, I had to work a late shift. They planned to go out for dinner and to the pub and I left them to it. I came home at 11pm and my mum had moved nearly all of the furniture around and all my books and kitchen stuff were moved to different shelves or cupboards. She even moved my bed in my room. So when I opened the bedroom door, it hit the bed. I was fuming. I angrily fixed what I could that night before going to bed. I spoke to her about it the next day and explained that it's my home and I had it how I liked, so stop, please. I put everything else back, which took hours. She just grumbled the whole time that it looked better her way. Their last day, I nipped out to the shops to get us some nice bits for lunch. And in the hour I was gone, she'd done it again. Moved all my kitchen stuff around to where she liked it. Again, I told her off. My house, my rules. She still maintained it was better her way and I should just let her crack on. Fine, I let her do what she wanted and I put my stuff back when they left. So, my revenge? Well, I went to visit their house six months later... And I did the same to her. She went out to work one day and I rearranged every bit of furniture I could by myself. Everything. I swapped the dining room and living room furniture over. So you had to walk food through the living room and across the hallway to get to the dining room. I swapped their bedroom and guest room curtains over. The windows were different sizes. So their now bedroom curtains were two foot two shorts. Even the pointless little things like moving the spoons to a different side of the drawer. And I moved every photo on the walls to a different wall. I rearranged the fridge. It all took me seven hours. My stepdad was home while I did it and laughed his head off the whole time. He refused to help but understood, so let me crack on. Neither me nor my stepdad said anything when she got home. We just sat watching TV, which was now in what was their dining room. And I asked her how it was work. She didn't say a word. She walked around the house, taking it all in for 20 minutes. Then came and sat down, looked at me and said point taken they'd put it back to how it was the next time i visited we've not spoken of it since now this is amazing not just the revenge which is of course brilliant not just the fact that your stepdad sat there and said yep i can't get involved but i'm a massive proponent for this but also the fact that your mum completely accepted and knew instantly 
what had happened. The fact that you've not spoken about it since is so good. The respect is there. Your mum gets it. You've played a blinder. Your stepdad loved it. Overall, this is just brilliant petty revenge. Got the point across. No one was upset. The beauty of this subreddit. Now for our next petty revenge story. Don't want to pay me for my work? Let me remind you of our contract terms. So back in the day, I worked as a commercial photographer. Most of my clients were great, but a few like to drag payment out or think they could just not pay me because they were a big company and I was just one guy. I had one assignment where I delivered about two dozen images of models with their products. It was a pretty big deal for me. At every step of the way, they expressed their delight with all of the images I delivered. They would paid me one third up front and after delivering the images, I billed them for the balance. And I waited and waited and waited. Nothing. Every time I called, I got some excuse until they just stopped answering my calls. Then it happened. They published the images and in ways that went beyond what our licensing agreement had covered. So not only had they not paid me for the usage we'd agreed to, they'd used the images in ways that went well beyond what we'd agreed to. They still weren't answering or returning my calls. Okay, they want to screw around, they're going to find out. So one of the things in my standard licensing agreement is a condition that says licensing is contingent upon payment in full. So by not paying me, all of their usage is considered infringement, not just the usage outside of our agreement terms. One thing I did when setting up my business is establish a good relationship with a lawyer. It helps that my cousin is a lawyer with good friends. So I call my lawyer and detail everything that's gone down. He sends them a letter letting them know we intend to sue for infringement since the images were never licensed and that the penalty is like $150,000 per image and block their use of the images altogether. I know they got the letter because they called me freaking out, offering excuses. We were in the process of paying you. It had been three months past the due date, accusing me of poisoning our working relationship. Well, if you wanted a good working relationship, you would have stuck by our original agreement and paid me. I ended the call by telling them they needed to deal with my lawyer. They must have consulted with their own lawyer, who evidently told them just how screwed they'd be if they went to court over this. In the end, I settled for less than what I asked for in the initial demand, but it was far more than if they'd just paid me and negotiated for the additional usage. Oh yeah, seems legit. Haven't paid for three months, but then as soon as you put it on them, oh no, we've been in the process of doing it. Payments take three months sometimes. You know what? I work with, or at least have worked with in the past, a lot of brands across a multitude of my own media. This channel you guys would have seen on the likes of Spotify, Apple, etc. And to be honest, it's pretty obvious which ones are messing you about and which ones aren't. And Sadly, some of them do. I can't lie. Some of them take ages. Now, the majority have a policy of either 30 or 60 days to pay invoices, which is completely fair. But a lot of them actually just pay in like a day. When you ask them, they just do it because that's all it takes. It's the same as me paying you, a friend or a family. Yeah, they might have to expense it and go through some formal stuff within their company, but the actual payment literally takes a day maximum. I mean, even internationally, a few days maximum. So the fact that they're waiting three months and then coming up with BS just proves that it is BS. And uh, yeah, the good thing is you got more than you would have done in the first place. Ultimately, they wasted their own time and their own money. And uh, yeah, came across as pretty stupid. OP, well done. Car salesman talks himself out of a sale. About seven years ago, I, 26 at the time, got a new job, which meant we didn't need our two cars. So my wife, who was 27, decided that we would sell both our cars and buy a bigger, nicer single car. We both had well-paying and stable jobs and additionally had the support of a low interest loan from parents to fund a purchase. We did our research extensively and decided that there were two options for us, a Ford Mondeo or a Kia Seed with our preference for the Mondeo. We'd worked out all the financials and had the spreadsheets to calculate that we could afford both secondhand. At this point, we found our local dealerships and booked appointments with both to test drive the cars so that we could make a final decision. We arrived at the Kia dealership and all went fine. We liked the car and the salesperson was helpful. We happily trundled across to the full garage for our appointment and were met by John the salesman. John was an old white salesman who clearly been selling cars for years and he'd clearly made a snap decision about the young couple in front of him. John sat us down at his desk and proceeded to tell us how expensive and exclusive the Mondeo was and he wasn't sure we'd be able to afford it. He asked us our budget and we told him, but he didn't seem to accept it. He wanted us to tell him our salaries and other financial data and we refused, saying we just wanted to test drive one. He told us he couldn't let us do that unless he knew we were serious buyers. 
We even asked if we could at least see inside one and he refused that too We left and walked back into the Kia dealership and bought the car we test drove earlier And we were very happy with it keeping it for the next six years. This wasn't enough for me though I took a picture of the Kia and sent it to the manager of the Ford branch to say that we'd bought the Kia because of the actions of John. The reply from the manager was surprising. He replied that he was devastated because their margins were so tight and explained that John would receive a reprimand for losing them money. So, moral of the story, don't judge a book by its cover. Now this, to me, is just as simple as bad salesmanship. Don't you think? Like, even if you're not entirely sure, even if... You know, you think, okay, it's more than likely these guys can't afford it. Why don't you just do it anyway? Give them the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what? Yeah, go for a test drive. Aren't there, I don't know, some sort of finance plans that you can put in place? Payment plans as well for people that don't have the cash outright. I mean, there definitely are. And for that to, to take place or for you to offer that must be kind of feasible, right? To people that don't have loads of money or don't seem really wealthy when you first look at them or are in their mid-20s. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. A Ford Mondeo isn't the most expensive of cars out there. I get it more if, you know, you had two random teens who were like, yeah, uh, any chance I can test drive a Ferrari today? Then probably you're going to be like, okay, let's not make that happen. But given the spot we now know that John and the company were in, this branch anyway, surely it's in your interest to say, yeah, let's do it. What are you losing out on? A bit of time, half an hour driving about, looking inside a car. Really? Is that not worth it? Ultimately, yeah, John deserved to be reprimanded. Maybe you just couldn't be bothered. Nonetheless, whatever it is, that's very poor from John. Now for our final petty revenge story of this episode. Want to charge us extra for something that didn't happen? Have fun with your reviews tanking. This happened a few years ago. My girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I used to vacation in Asheville, booking cabins through a rental company. She grew up there and loved it. Plus, she had friends and family in the area that we would visit while there. One of the rules the company had was that no extra guest was allowed to stay overnight, or there'd be a fee. This rule never bothered us as we never planned on having that. But we did invite a couple of my girlfriend's friends over to hang out for a little while. They got there around 7 or 8 and stayed until about 11 before heading home. We finished the trip, had a great time, and went home thinking all was good. A couple of days after we got home, I got an email from a woman in the rental company who claimed that their maintenance guy saw that we had people stay over and we were being charged an extra $200 for breaking occupancy rules. Next came a back and forth between her and I where I told them nobody stayed overnight and that they left around 10 30 to 11 p.m But she claimed to me that occupancy is anyone being in the cabin at all Which made no sense. I looked up the legal definition of occupancy which did not side with her But she told me it didn't matter and they charged me the extra 200 Cue the revenge between my girlfriend and I we got about eight people with 20 different google accounts all leaving one star reviews on the company's google page this took their rating of around 4.4 all the way down to the mid three stars it was a local company well someone higher up must have gotten wind of this and they knew exactly who did it within a couple of hours i got several emails from the original woman and her supervisor apologizing for the misunderstanding and asking how they could get us to take down the bad reviews after telling them it was clearly not a misunderstanding I told them to kick rocks since they wanted to treat us that way and long story shorter than it could be We ended up getting an offer of 200 off our next visit if we took the reviews down And they obviously refunded me that extra 200 plus another hundred off that stay Karen, I hope you understand what occupancy means now if you still have a job and there we go an age-old revenge to finish up this episode nothing worse if you're a company than seeing your online rating i mean we all know how important trust is and online ratings are these days in the modern world just absolutely tank i mean 4.4 is not great to begin with but seeing that go below four to the mid threes ish you're not getting any business from anyone who who checks up online and, and sees those reviews uh yeah terrible stuff to be honest with you what are you actually doing like occupancy rules are not just they're just i don't even have to look that up to know that it just means that you don't have to stay overnight or you're not allowed to stay overnight going to someone's house from seven to ten is obviously allowed i do know that that across you know a lot of the world the occupancy rules are very very tight i know personally that one of my friends who's in barcelona right now has pretty strict occupancy rules but again that's for people staying over and they have to pay a fee if they want that to happen but to just go and visit someone for a few hours you don't have to pay for that 
That's insane. I also just don't really get how it's in the interest of this company, unless they're just after some quick cash, but it's so exploitative. Surely it'd be better to say, you know what, guys? We're actually pretty relaxed with this. Yeah, you can't have anyone to stay over, but people can come around as much as you like. That'll be more of an incentive for you or your employer or your friends that come over to rebook with this sort of company in future, right? Rather than saying, oh, no, there's a window of only... 30 minutes that I can come and visit someone. That's just too much hassle. It's too hard to police yourself and manage yourself. So you wouldn't do it again. It's a weird business model. It's very predatory and I don't like it. And there we go, guys. That is going to do it for this episode of r slash nuclear event. Really hope you enjoyed it. Three hours of some of the best stories that I personally have ever narrated. And that's coming from me. I don't know how many videos I've made now on the channel. Well over a thousand. That is for sure. So uh, yeah, if there's anyone you can trust, it's going to be me. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did and you want more from me regularly every single day, hit the subscribe button or the follow button on whatever platform you're on. And I'll see you guys all tomorrow for some brand new, amazing Reddit stories.